Welcome to Friday on the AM Show, another opportunity for us to serve you. My name is Benjamin Akaku. I do this together with Bernice Abubedu Lansa. Wow, the year is drawing to an end and this month as well. What can we say? Merry Christmas in advance. Now, coming up on the show uh, this morning, Kodjo Brace, my colleague, will be joining me as we dig into the papers. But then we get into our big stories. I'll be telling you about Parliament. Well, it is on recess, but members of Parliament have been voting on the budget for the year 2023. They've been voting for the appropriations. The e-levy will be retained uh, at 1%. In fact, it has decreased from 1.5% to 1%, but uh, the 100 Ghana CD threshold still remains. They also approved the new VAT with a 2.5% increment. Today, we assess those matters, how it turned out in Parliament, as government announced an exemption of all pension funds from the debt exchange program. Our guest, Eugene Bwachi MP for Subin. He's been in the news lately. We also have Alassane Suini, Member of Parliament, Tamale North. Samuel Bing is Executive Director, Parliamentary Network Africa. And we have Dr. Kwesi Amachi, a political scientist. Well, today we've got blunt thoughts for you as well. I'll be sharing my thoughts with you later on the show. But you also get the chance to share your thoughts with us on what you think about Mother Ghana and where the ship is headed. Do stay with us. Up next, the news. Thank you for staying with us for the news. In our first story, government has announced an exemption of all pension funds from the debt exchange program. This follows a meeting between organized labor, the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, the Finance Ministry, the National Security Ministry, and all other parties involved yesterday. At a news conference, Minister for Employment and Labor Relations, Ignatius Bafwewa, announced he would work to explore mutually beneficial options within the debt sustainability terms. This is a memorandum of understanding dated Today, Thursday, 22nd December 2022. Following meetings held at the Ministry of Finance in December 2022 between the Government of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of National Security on the one hand, and organized labor stroke associations represented by leadership of all labor unions stroke associations on the other hand to resolve issues on the exemptions of all pension funds in the domestic debt exchange exchange program announced by government on the 5th of december 2022 government has decided to grant exemption to all pension funds in the domestic debt exchange program and Government and organized labor will, however, work together to explore mutually beneficial options within debt sustainability limits and to also promote microeconomic stability and economic recovery in the spirit of social partnership. Signed, Ignatius Bafoua, Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, Ken Ofori Atta, Minister of Finance, Anthony Yaba, Doctor, Secretary General, Trades Unions Congress, Ghana for Organized Labor Stroke Associations. Now, Finance Minister Ken Ofori Atta said the threat of a strike would have adversely affected the gains made in bringing stability to the economy. He added government would find means of pl plugging the holes to attain the 55% debt-to-GDP ratio. Um, as you know, on December 13th, um, we signed this historic um, staff-level agreement with the fund, which brought a sense of stability. Yesterday, as you know, until 4.30 a.m., um, Parliament passed appropriation and the budget um, further bringing confidence as to where we are going. Um, so, of course, the threat um, of, a, of a strike will not have inured um, to the spirit of the direction of where the nation is going. Obviously, um, the issue of uh, exempting 
um, pension funds from it is at a cost. And um, we have committed uh, government and um, labor, um, organized labor, to work together um, to ensure um, that we find means of plugging um, a hole that uh, that should um, ensure that we return um, to the 55% threshold. And I think that we are all committed to because we know it's important um, to lead us to uh, a board agreement um, so that we continue uh, with the success that we have. Um, but really in the spirit of Christmas and the partnership that we have, um, we want to thank everybody who participated in this uh, on the way forward. Um, the government has done its part with the SLA. Parliament came through very strongly yesterday with the SLA. And uh, Labour today um, is also showing an accommodation not only to receive the exemptions, um, but to also work to make sure that we restore to debt sustainability. Um, and we thank you for that. Well, meanwhile, the Trades Union Congress has rescinded its decision to embark on an indefinite nationwide industrial action to protest earlier plans by the administration to include pension funds in the debt exchange program. We have reached a deal that we think is in the interest of this country. There is no way that such a thing should happen again. We have promised them that we will continue to work together as social partners so that our country will get back to the stability that will benefit all of us. And we also like to thank the press for being with us. The way you carry through this demand has contributed enormously to government's uh, position that we are announcing now. So we thank you very much for that. And I would like to thank all members of all organized labor groups. Because, you see, when we get to this level, without the support, we will fail. But we are here today because our members supported us. And we thank you very much for that support. We are hoping that government will continue to create a space for us to continue the engagement to bring down inflation and to stable, stabilize the country. Because without that, this achievement will even come to naught. We have to do that all together. On this note, I would like to officially inform our members that the intended strike we announced on the 19th has been called off. We will monitor the situation and if we have to come back to you, we will. I would like to repeat that on the 27th, nobody should stay at home. Please go back to work. Because our demand, our demand has been met. And the condition we gave ourselves was that if our demand is met, we will organize this conference, press conference, and inform you. And that is why we are uh, uh, organizing this press conference. I would like to repeat that on the 27th of December, we are all going back to work. Nobody should stay at home. There is no strike. Uh, and we are very thankful to God for this. Well, it is an enterprise that was built to create employment for women who became single mothers uh, due to a controversial customary practice that exists in many parts of the Upper East region. Now, more than 20 years on, the Zwarungu Single Mothers Rice Processing Center has survived difficult times to become well-established. But despite support from both government and non-governmental organizations, the women who work there still struggle to make profit, especially with the current economic crisis in the country. Joy News correspondent Albert Sori has more. The Zwarungu Single Mothers Rice Processing Center was started in the year 2001 by a group of women who became single mothers due to a rather controversial customary practice which bars a man and a woman from the same community from getting married. The reason behind this practice is that people from the same community 
may have one descendant and therefore are considered to be brothers and sisters. However, in contradiction to this same belief, amorous relationships between men and women from these same communities are not exactly frowned upon. To put it simply, sexual relations between men and women from these communities are not a taboo, but marriages between them are strictly prohibited. A child born out of such relationships cannot be claimed by the father. By custom, such a child belongs to the father of the woman and therefore the biological father may choose not to support that child in any way. One of the results of this practice is that the women who give birth to children from this type of relationship find themselves automatically becoming single mothers. The women who started the Single Mothers Rice Processing Center here in the Daborin community of Zwarungu were victims of this old traditional practice. They wanted to come together to support each other to economically empower themselves. As single mothers, because in the communities with the sister in bed relationships, most of them are always dropouts. They drop out from school. The man cannot marry you because it's a taboo. Sometimes you cannot marry again because nowadays men don't want to marry women who are already having children. So you'll be rendered what hopeless. If you are not able to take care of them, they become street children. Faustina Abagre is a member of the Single Mothers Association and currently runs the Rice Processing Center. She says the center has survived many hurdles over the years to become a well-established enterprise, economically empowering hundreds of women. Also, the association no longer limits membership to women who became single mothers as a result of that traditional practice, but to widows as well. We were, we were more than even 900. We came as Single Mothers Association, but widows are also included. And now we have the women in agriculture, which the women in seven districts in this region have come together to see how best we can talk to the duty bearers. After farming, what next? Processing. And we need help from the government. So we've come together and we have formed this Women in Agriculture. Today, the Zwarungo Single Mothers Rice Processing Center is well equipped thanks to support from a Canadian charity and from the government. We were trained into rice processing by the Ministry of Agriculture and then Food Research Institute trained us to be able to eyeball rice differently from the local way. Youth Harvest used us to train all the women groups who are doing rice processing in the region. Sokodevi is a Canadian NGO that has come to help those women whom we trained to enhance their rice processing. So they, they came and partnered with us. We have our three in one meal, they, they brought the color sota, they brought all these machines so that it can enhance our rice processing. Now a $35.9 million market systems and resilience program has been launched in the Upper West region to increase commercialization and profitability of the market actors and strengthen institutional capacity in the agriculture ecosystem. Uh, seven districts in four regions in the Northern Belt will benefit from the program. The program, which is a five-year project funded by USAID, will target about 200,000 beneficiaries. Rafiq Salam reports from WA. The Market Systems and Resilience MSR Activity Program is a five-year initiative program aimed at increasing inclusive agriculture in four regions in the northern Gulf of the country. It is a $35.9 million program implemented by the Agriculture Cooperative Development International, ACDI, 
and the Volunteers in Overseas Cooperative Assistance, VOCA, an international development nonprofit organization and funded by USAID. Under the program, farmers will be supported in the cultivation of nine crops, namely maize, shea, bambara and soya beans, cowpea, granules, horticulture, mango and moringa. Deputy Chief Party for the Market Systems and Resilience Activity Program, Cecil Osai, threw more light on the four main objectives of the program. This grant is part of the bigger project or activity, as USCID calls it now, uh, which is $35.9 million. So the whole program is geared towards improving economic conditions in northern Ghana. Uh, through agriculture, particularly to improve economic growth that touches on smallholder farmers and all those in the agricultural sector. So we work through bigger farmers to reach smallholder farmers. We work through processes, we work through all those who source material from smallholder farmers or who work with them, providing inputs and other services so that they would also experience the economic growth. First, they will get profits and their enterprises, farms will grow and they will use the profits to invest and they will expand. And when there's a general economic growth, they will also participate and benefit from it. The program held in WA is the fifth and climax of series of launches held earlier in Accra, Tamale, Nalarogo, and Bolgatanga. It is aimed at exercising stakeholders in the agricultural value chain to know more about the program to enable them to take part Please and benefit from your it. Online it is a multi-million dollar program it will be led by six million dollar grant for prospective applicants. Six million facility, uh, five million open to uh, everybody, including smallholder farmers, and the uh, processes and buyers and all those people and then one million dedicated for capacity building through our partners olam food ingredients as part of its community programs aimed at improving the livelihoods of cashew farmers and their households is providing technical and infrastructural support on beekeeping to over 100 female dependents of cashew farmers in the Bono, Bono East, and Savannah regions. Branch manager of Olam Food Ingredients, uh, Rawal Kutiwayori, says this will create sustainable jobs to generate an alternative source of income capable of supporting them during off cashew seasons. And our Sabid has more in this report. A total of 100 female dependents of cashew farmers in the Bono, Bono East and Savannah regions have received beekeeping trainings and additional hives and processing equipment as part of Olam Food Ingredients Project which aims at addressing food insecurity and creating sustainable alternative source of livelihood for farmers in rural cashew growing communities. The project according to the branch manager for OFI Ruel Kuti Boyori is implemented in partnership with Costco Wholesale. Today's event is yet another uh, new project that we are bringing on board in beekeeping uh, to support female uh, farmers uh, in general. Uh, we are looking at uh, supporting them with uh, beekeeping uh, uh, items and also to train them so that they are able to engage in this uh, enterprise. And so that is what we are here. The project actually is co, uh, I mean, sponsored, I mean, funded by um, Costco. Yeah, Costco is going into partnership with OFI to be able to uh, execute this project. He also noted that the move forms part of OFI's corporate social responsibility that aims at eradicating poverty in rural communities, adding that beneficiaries must work on making good use of the training and equipment received. As part of our corporate uh, responsibility and uh, sustainability, today's uh, event is yet another big one, and we entreat the women who are the beneficiaries to make good use of this uh, items that we are presenting to them to ensure that they use them for the purposes that I mean we are supporting them and at the end of the day they will benefit to be able to support their households even as their husbands are also struggling on the cashew farms. 
Some of the beneficiaries were thankful to the organizers of the training and asked that the beekeeping kits would help them in supporting their families and their children's education. Also present at the event is the Municipal Chief Executive for Tichiman, Benjamin Yaujako, who was thankful to OFI's initiative and move he said confirms government's poverty eradication measures. Anna Sabit, Joy News, Tichiman. And on the cultural note, uh, that's how we end the news. Stay with us for the news review. Up next. Well, thank you for staying with us on the AM show. Time now for us to get into the newspapers. And I'm joined by Samuel Kojo Brace, my colleague. Uh, Samuel, if you can hear me, a very good morning to you. Good morning to you, Ben. How are you? Ah, oh, well, it's another morning. Uh, we thank God for life and everything that he gives us. How are things at your end? Oh, uh, things are fine by grace. God has been good to us. I mean, mm. We've seen another December. Yeah, we can't complain. We can only thank him for the mercies. Indeed, we can only thank him. Well, let's uh, get into the papers. But some interesting developments uh, uh, some of which the papers uh, capture, of course, that bit about the exemption of the pension funds from the debt exchange program. In fact, let's start from there. The Finder newspaper, Parliament passes Appropriation Bill 2022. There is also a Foriata exempts pension funds from debt exchange program. Then there's Professor Kwesi Butri laid to rest. May his soul rest in perfect peace. And then 2,171 crashed uh, to death in 11 months. It represents a reduction of 18.2%. The final newspaper says crashed. I don't know whether they meant crashed, but of course, both of them are relevant depending on the context. So there were these crashes in 11 months. It represents a reduction of 18.2%. Uh, but let's start with uh, that appropriations bill and then the exemption of pension funds. In fact, let's look at the pension funds first. That is what uh, was going to trigger the industrial action mm. by the TUC. So yeah. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata has announced an exemption of all pension funds from the ongoing debt exchange program. This follows a meeting between organized labor, the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, the Finance Ministry, National Security Ministry, and all other parties involved. The exemption of all pension funds, however, is subject to the government and organized labor working together to explore mutually beneficial options within the debt sustainability terms. After the meeting yesterday, a seven-member committee was formed to explore technical solutions to bring the debt threshold back to sustainable limits. Now, a memorandum of understanding between the government and organized labor agreed the way forward, and the MOU, of course, was signed by the different parties. Uh, what would you say, Brace, has the arm of the finance minister, the finance ministry, and by extension, government, been twisted? I always keep reiterating, the TUC is 500,000 members strong. Do you think government has been compelled, finally, to do this? Um, exactly. Uh, it has been. And the people sounded the alarm that if you don't do what we're looking for, we will call for an industrial action. And, mm. and if 
TUC was going to call for an industrial action, you know how the economy was going to be battered by that. Because from the cleaners to the doctors, everybody was going to go. And you know the doctors even came up with uh, a roadmap as to how uh, they were going to carry out their strike. So right. it was an imminent total collapse of the economy that the, the, the government could not stand. Right. And therefore, I had to do something. So, yes, you would be right to say that it had it has been compelled to because government was was you know was bent on making sure that it included the pension funds in securing this deal with the IMF. But Labour said no, we cannot allow you to do that. And and they did everything they could because look, they called for government to sit down with them. Government did it. They called another meeting again. Government did it. Then they sounded an alarm that. We're giving government this ultimatum. If government doesn't do anything about it, we will announce an intention to strike. Government still didn't. And mm. they went ahead to then uh, declare that by this day in December, if government doesn't tell us its decision to withdraw our pension funds from uh, this debt exchange program, we will strike. And government, uh, seeing the trouble that it, it faced, with a strike like that, we we'll to say, okay, well, I concede. I will, with, I will exempt, uh, you know, pension funds from this whole debt exchange program. So at the end of the day, labor got what it wanted, and government also, in a way, prevented what could have been a disastrous uh, period in, in the economy of Ghana. So uh, it's a win-win, per se, but government may want to say that, well, I've lost in terms of trying to include you in the getting an, a deal with the IMF. So if you look at it, Labour won, government won, but government won were, were by limping on its, feet, uh, on, on its foot, yeah. Mm. Let's look at some other stories. 2,171 uh, crashed to death in 11 months and provisional data compiled by the Motor Traffic and Transport Department of the Ghana Police Service shows that the number of commuters killed in road traffic crashes recorded in the first 11 months uh, declined by 18.2% compared to the same period of 2021. An improvement on, in enforcement by the MTTD and increase in awareness creation by the National Road Safety Authority are largely responsible for the reductions. Fatalities also dropped from 2,654 last year to 2,171 between um, January and November 2022. Uh, the, the, the statistics are still gory, but we're seeing an improvement in practically all the metrics, and that, that, that is something that we cannot run away from. Uh, 1,708 males got killed, 463 females died this year. Now, for every one female who lost her life, four males lost their lives. I don't know whether that has anything to do with, uh, I wouldn't say the recklessness, but the aggression with which men tend to drive. You know, women usually are more sober on the road compared to yeah. most, most men. But I've seen women too, who, Charlie, hey, they're my driving, you check like F1, <laughs> F1, <laughs> F1 drivers. And in terms of commercial yeah, vehicles. There are only a few of them. Yeah, right before you come in, commercial vehicles uh, killed 740 commuters, representing 34%. Uh, and with motorcycles, they killed 892, representing 41%. Uh, Quick reactions. Well, uh, but before I come here, let me just uh, make a quick remark on the earlier subject. You know, in the, in the MOU, government and labor would have to find mutually beneficial ways of ensuring that we reduce the debt to GDP ratio to 55%. It will be interesting to know what we're going to do, what, I mean, what we're going to find the sources or what, how we're going to reach there. So uh, I wish that the ministry could give us, you know, more details about how they intend to, without the pension funds, reduce the debt to GDP ratio. But, but that, that's, that, that's it. Now, when it comes to uh, carnage on our roads, and you are right to say that men are probably aggressive than women, because look, I've seen fewer women who drive sometimes like some men, but majority of women, Ben, you, you, you drive, I mean, when you are driving behind a woman, you can tell that there's a woman, because she doesn't want to overtake anybody, 
Mm. You see, he's too cautious on the road. Mm -hmm. It looks like they don't even want to bump him into a pothole. You know, that's how careful women are. But for us men, I don't know whether we are always on the move. I don't know why we are always like that. Whether it's our nature or what, but we are always faster. We want to overtake. We want to, even though overtake, we want to overtake in caps. We want to overtake when we can see clearly. I, um, you know, I always say that as a driver, you can only do a proper overtaking when you can see about 10 cars ahead of you. Then you can do your calculation well to, say, to know that, well, I can overtake one, two, or three. Right. But if you, can, you cannot see about 10 cars ahead of you, I think it's inappropriate or it's not better for you to overtake, you know. So it is, it is about, well, the, the road safety authority is doing its best. MTTU are doing what they, they can. But the responsibility, the primary responsibility lies on, on you, the individual. Because when it comes to safety and health, right. it is not someone who has to tell you that you need to check how safe you are. It is you. You would have to ensure that your safety is paramount to you. Then every other thing that comes to add-on will be an add-on, really. It won't be that someone is directing you to do the right thing. You know that this overtaking I want to do is not right. You don't have to see a policeman before you behave on the road. You have to, as a driver, have it at the back of your mind that, I mean, I have a family to return home to. Even if you don't have a family or a nuclear family, you have an extended family. So I have to be safe. Mm. How do I become, or how do I ensure that I'm safe? It's by ensuring that you obey road traffic regulations. Look, when I'm driving in a built up area, the highest speed I go is 30. Sometimes I can even come as low as 15, looking at the nature of the built up area I'm driving through. But some people even overtake in the built up area. I've had cause to chase some drivers, you know, just to warn them that why did you drive like that in that built up area? It looks like we don't even understand the regulations that govern, you know, our uh, driving. So I, I, I guess for some people, th there are mm. rules in terms of if you're driving on the motorway, you'd be doing a hundred thereabouts. If, if you're in yeah. an urban area, you'd have to do just around 50 or less. But I guess yeah. from time to time, we all at a point throw caution to the wind and... We, we, we do practically anything. I mean, I wouldn't sit yeah. here and pretend that I never flout any of, any of those rules. Mm. It's, it's not humanly possible. Mm. But, but I'm saying that we should be a lot more cautious. We've made quite yeah. a lot of gains this year. We all get, you know, sometimes you're, you're late for that gathering. And one thing I've noticed, uh, Kojo, especially in this time when Christmas is approaching and though we all claim the system is not what it should be, the traffic is what it, 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 it is most of the time. I had to go for an event yesterday, which saw me getting home very late. And trust me, the traffic, the traffic mm. getting into town, it, it was just crazy, mm. Kojo. So mm. sometimes you see, so, so, you see so, people getting mm. unnecessarily aggressive because everyone, your fuel is burning, you are thinking of the cost, you are thinking of when you'll get to your destination, and people are trying mm -hmm. to cut all kinds of corners. You see the overtakings and you realize that, Charlie. This one, yeah. people shouldn't be doing them, but they are. Sometimes, I, I believe that, you know, you, we can allow for some emergencies, you mm. know. I always say that when you see someone doing something, you probably have to ask why. Yeah. It appears the fee to uh, Samuel Kojo Brace uh, has frozen just for a moment. We'll try to reconnect with him. Hello, Kojo. If you can hear me, you can go ahead. Yeah, Ben. So, so I was saying that, you know, we, we just need to find out from... from we, we, sometimes someone might be on the verge of dying and someone is trying to help the person to the hospital. I'm just saying that, like you said, we should be cautious in such instances. We should ensure. All right, so the connection there to Samuel Kojo Brace, a little bit problematic uh, today. We'll try to work it out and uh, get him back. But let's uh, dig into that paper and look at the appropriation 
And uh, so quite a number of stories from Parliament in the middle spread of uh, the paper. There's also first delivery of oil products under oil for gold policy set for January. That's according to Dr. Baumia. But even before he made mention of this, I had had an interaction with Deputy Energy Minister and Member of Parliament for Second D. I'm talking about Andrew Ejapa Mercer, who had hinted at this. So what does the story say? The much applauded, uh, that's how the final newspaper puts it, Gold for oil policy will be implemented beginning next month, Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baumia has announced. The oil for gold initiative announced by the Vice President last month will see Ghana pay for imported oil products with gold in a move which the Vice President explained would impact positively on Ghana's US dollar foreign exchange reserve, fuel prices and general cost of living. Vice President Baumia, in a post on his Facebook page, announced that the initiative will start next month with the first delivery of oil products under the policy. Uh, Kojo, so you were making a point. Wrap up on that so we can also uh, look at the oil for gold situation. You heard Andre mm. Japamersa talk about it with me uh, for the first time here on the AM yeah. show. And now the vice president has added his voice. Uh, you can just round up mm. with the thoughts you were sharing and get to this one. So I was just saying that we should be careful when we are driving. Right. We all do sometimes get emergencies, but we should understand the regulations. Even if you have an emergency in a built-up area, you should, you should know how you can cross it. So for, just for us to be careful when we are driving on the road, Ben. We all do love speed. No, look, I speed well, when I'm on the highway, but when I'm in the built-up area, watch it so we just have to be careful right to help in reducing further uh, the people who are losing their lives in both countries yeah so we heard andre now, japan Mercer is, talk about oil for gold mm -hmm. now the vice president is re-echoing it for you mm -hmm. what is your reading of the situation look ben it's good um this morning i went to filler uh and i spent was it 300 cities and to know that i'm filling up with uh, per liter around 13 sometimes 12 some people even do 10.45 it was just sweet for me mm -hmm. and i said wow wait you spent how really much know. because i also you know did same yesterday and uh i spent quite a lot more than twice of that way more than twice of that okay. so so uh, okay. where 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 is it what what kind of engine do you use is it a 1.6 liter oh, engine well well if my, my tank wasn't empty usually i okay. don't allow my tank to be empty before i top up because right. I, I usually want that thing to be down so i had two bars that, when i when i went i had two bars and i think there are 12 bars in all in all so i think i i needed oh, some okay. 10 bars yeah okay okay but you know at the level where it is mm -hmm. uh, or where it was when i was buying about two three weeks ago i could at the same level i could spend close to 500 Something okay. Six hundred. So in a week, I'll be spending close to thousand cities. So, so but in in effect, what what you're saying then is mm. uh, it's decreased by about half, just about. Oh yeah, yeah. For yeah. you. Yeah, really. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, that's why I'm saying that. I mean, I was I, when, when I I bought it, I was like, wow, this is this is quite quite, quite sweet. And that's even though mm. it could come it could come down further, and that's why this growth for oil thing that is going to come in January, we will see. If everything should stay safe, it means that we'll see a further decline in prices of four products. And that would be huge for all of us. Because that would be a great, when, greatly yeah. positive. Because look, still, yeah. still, I, I remember when I used to fill up my tank with 200 and something CDs, you know? Oh. And, and it shut up to the point where I was filling my tank. Well, of course, I changed vehicles, but I was filling my tank with 800 CDs plus, mm. I mean, it's been crazy. Mm. It's been crazy. Yeah. So, so, so it will be a huge relief to all of us. Those who uh, take public transport will have reduction in transport fares. And you know how the rippling effect of all of that, it would, it would, it would affect the, how much we buy food produce. It would even affect how much we buy cooked food, you know. Mm. So it's, it, it's a great development that our first tranche will be coming in January. I pray that once that is coming, government is still able to, to sustain the appreciation of the city against the dollar. 
Right. That will further mean that price of uh, fuel products would have to come down and would all benefit. Because look, when I was buying fuel this morning, I thought a huge relief. Mm. And look at what it will do if it, will, it, will, it should go further down for us to even buy a liter for seven cities or even six cities, my friend. We will all be jumping in this country. So, so it, it's something that I'm happy about. I pray that we're able to sustain the gains we're making now so that the prices of, of goods and services in this country can still be coming down really bad. So I'm, I'm excited by this. I pray that it is sustainable that we can do it and do it better. Uh, I am even more excited than you are because the dent, uh, you know, purchasing fuel at over 800 CDs for about four to five weeks, depending on how many weeks are in a month, for so many months, trust me, the impact has been very negative. But I also find something interesting. I was just reflecting, maybe philosophically. You know how sometimes you have something and then uh, it, it gets out of your grasp and when you return, if you are able to return to that thing, you feel as though the entire world, in terms of appreciation, I don't know whether you get what I mean, but uh, mm. we used to purchase fuel a liter at around four something. It rose to around uh -huh. eight, nine, ten, thereabouts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then shot up to about 18, 19. 18. If we get yeah. back to the, the levels we used to be at, I mean, we would all appreciate it, but it also reminds me of how sometimes you have something and maybe you don't appreciate it enough, and then you lose it. <laughs> and later when you come back, you act as though you had found something glorious. But in fact, that was the same thing you had uh, long exactly before. Right. So I, I agree with you. You know, when we were at four, we were complaining. Now we are praying that let's come to four. So yeah, I agree with you. It's just, it's just like in life, sometimes when you have something, you don't value it. Right. But when you lose it, that's when you begin to say, wow. Wow, you know, I yeah. think that thing was serving me really well. So, yeah, yeah. that's our life is. It's human nature. <laughs> Reminds me of that Janet Jackson song. You never know what you've got until it's gone. Until but let's check out gone. Parliament. So, Parliament passes Appropriation Bill 2022, and government has the go-ahead to spend $227.80 from the Consolidated Fund and other public funds for the 2023 fiscal year. Then there's also the story, Parliament passes value-added tax amendment bill 2022. And of course, that was, so the Speaker of Parliament put it to a voice vote, and he said the majority had it, but the minority protested. So there was a head count, and then it ended up with the minority securing 135 votes as against the majority's 136. So the 2.5% increment also kicks in. But then there was this interesting one. Parliament maintains 100 Ghana CD uh, Momo threshold in new e-levy bill. I think the mi minority has done a fantastic job on a number of things in yeah. recent times. On the National Cathedral, and I insist we don't need a National Cathedral right now. I don't even know. We have a, a major cathedral up north. If it's for tourism or some other things, why not work on some of the cathedrals uh, we have already? So... The, the National Cathedral not allowing... And, and it didn't make sense to me, Kojo. I don't know what you think. But 80 million Ghana CDs, the finance ministry couldn't de defend what it was going to be used for. The breakdown. The tourism ministry, interesting how they put it there. What they were going to use it for. They had no idea. The technical director was there. The minister was there. I mean, so for me, that, that is good riddance uh, as far as that is concerned. Then the Momo threshold... Some of us had insisted because it's the poorest of the poor who will be affected. Yeah. Now the threshold, thanks to the minority, has been retained and it's also been dropped from 1.5% to 1%. Quick reflections on, on these, uh, Kojo. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, uh, we should be proud of this parliament, especially the minority. They've done so well to keep this government in check. They have been... Just that they've let us down sometimes, but they have. Oh, they have definitely. Largely, mm. they have largely been been effective at, at ensuring that government uh, is doing what is expected, especially in this budget. It was interesting when I was following the proceedings how the minority will say that if government doesn't consent to do this, we will not allow this budget to go. And then the you know the finance minister was there yeah. together with his two deputies. So. Uh, I'll see the finance minister conferring with the majority side, and then the deputy will say, okay. We deputy majority leader, Afenyo Markin, yeah. 
Uh, yes, yes, you know, and then I, 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 Abna, or uh, say, or say, uh, sorry, we'll just say, okay, we, we'll, we'll, we concede, we will take this out. You know, I don't even know why the government still went ahead to put 18 million cities in the budget to be spent on the national cathedral, when almost, I mean, majority of Ghanaians have voiced their misgivings about this cathedral. Ben, I may defer with you in terms of we need in a cathedral or not. I think that it's, if you look at the tourism value of it, we need it. But we don't need to spend... But, but that's exactly my state. issue. Is it a need? And is it is it um, necessary now? That's my issue. Okay. It's not about... I mean, how long did it take the Americans, for example, to put up the cathedral in Washington, D.C.? Okay. You so, know, so, so my, it, my, it takes, my point for some people, 100, yeah. 200 years... You want to yeah. put up a cathedral in how many years and pump so much money? You see, those are the problems. No, no, no. So, so my point is that when the president said we wanted to build a national cathedral, he said we're going to build that it was going to be built by the church, mm. and that the state was only going to give them uh, seed, seed money. Money, right? So when we move from the church building it to now the state funding it, that's where the problem is. I don't think that's the that, official position, though. They still don't admit that the state is basically bankrolling this. But no, if you no, no, if you look at it, if you look at the figures that have come in, we don't need them to admit that the state is building it. Right. We are making the judgment that looking at how much we pumped into it's the, clear now, isn't the it? The state is the one. Yeah, exactly. The state is the one building it. But people, we Ghanaians who pay taxes whose revenue is used to run this economy, we say that we don't want the state to spend on it. Have you realized that even the church has withdrawn a little bit yeah. in terms of funding this project yeah. because the state is taking credit for it by, by spending our meager resources? And the reason why I'm paying is that this moment that the state itself has come out to say that we don't have money, mm. we are defaulting on several of our, 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 our loans. Right. And even people who have bought bonds. Why do we still go ahead to then spite us in the face to put in 18 million Ghana cities to be spent on a facility that majority of Ghanaians say we even don't need it because of how the state is, is going about it. Mm. And that's why I, I wonder what sort of consultation, what sort of thinking went into that. That in the face of public, public outcry, that we don't want this. We don't want it. Government still went ahead to say that we want to tell them we want to spend 18 million cities. Great. I don't know whether they did deep thinking about it before they put it in there because it is to tell the people that, well, whatever you say, I don't care. Yeah. And that was wrong. If mm. leadership wanted to show real leadership, that was something they shouldn't have done. And, and so I'm proud the minority got them to take it off. Right. Now they are saying that they are going to, they are going to uh, you know, redirect it to roads. Minority should mm -hmm. follow it to ensure that indeed it is being used to construct roads. Look, mm -hmm. there are poor roads in this country. When I went to a Sankagwa area, I was shocked by the nature of road, major road that is linking a Sankagwa to Bodie. Yeah. A place where we mm -hmm. get major cocoa from. We have allowed the road to deteriorate to that level. And we are spending 80 billion to build what? A cathedral in Accra. Why? Mm -hmm. So let the majority follow it to ensure that. We are using that road to build the road, some roads in Ghana. I think that road is very, very important. Can we tackle it? Where, uh, to move solar, uh, Garaba, they have been complaining about their roads. I mean, if we wanted to talk about roads, we would be able to mention so many of them. The Sokol so District. Many. I mean, so, so many of them. You, so, some are not even motorable. They are not roads. They, exactly. they are not even paths, you know. But yet, people, pregnant women, have to ply these paths. And, and yeah. some of them, the potholes causing miscarriages. If, if we could actually gauge the impact of bad roads on our economy, it would be terrible. And, it, you know, there's something interesting. I just recall a certain statistic some, uh, about a month ago. You know that in more developed countries, the, the, the road networks are better, and so uh, traffic congestion is lower. If you look at the, the, the map, okay, of less developed countries, especially here in Africa, in a place like Ghana, you would see that we are red because... Be because of bad roads, on account of bad roads, you can't get to your destination quickly. It hampers the economy. Yep. Trust me, if we could measure by what extent bad roads hamper our economy, we'd be shocked. 
But there's also lots, another angle to this. Man hours. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Some people also say that, and it's there's some testament to that here. The better the road, the more people speed, and the more people speed, the more accidents there are tying into the other conversation. So we have to find uh, middle ground in there. But for me, I guess uh, Kojo, you could start calling me Sambalat and Tobias. You know why? Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, the president, president said that anyone opposing the National <laughs> Cathedral is like Sambalat and Tobias. So you can call me Benjamin <laughs> Sambalat Tobias Akako. Well. Feel free. Uh, okay. Meet him near meeting. Okay, my friend Sambalat Tobias Akako. Uh, mm. Well, so the minority, we need them to continue what they're doing. They should ensure that they monitor to see where that 80 million is going to because right. we can be here, the government will go ahead and spend it and we won't know. When it comes to the uh, E-Levy, good that they've reduced it to 1% now. Good that minority was able to get them to maintain the 100% threshold. It's just that I'm a little uh, sad about the 2.5 VAT. That has been uh, retained. Someone will mm. say that we say we need development in this country. It is true we need development. But someone would also tell you that for all that we've paid in this country, what do we have to show? It is when people are showing work, like in the university, then you know in the halls, we say show work, show work. That's when you get people to follow you. I was having a chat with a friend of mine who has been to Rwanda, uh, and he says that, look, you, you speak to Ru the Rwandans, and they tell you that they see what Kagame is doing. And so majority of them are buying into his vision now. When they ask you to do anything, you do it. The guy was saying that the taxi driver said, look, I know that if I speed, over speed here, a camera will capture me and I'll be dealt with. I know that if I give bribe to a policeman, a cam they will all be taken to uh, court, will all be taken to prison. The policeman will come back to his job. I may probably not come back to my job. Right. So people are really supporting Kagame to do what he's doing in Rwanda. Mm. But is that the same in Ghana? Really, over the years, we've not seen that much has been done out of the taxes that we've paid. And that's why people do complain when government do come up with incrementing taxes or introduce new taxes. Right. So government should know that when it does something efficient or something prudent with our resources, the citizens will buy into everything he wants to do. It's right. time they, they start to convert the taxes we pay into tangible projects or, or investment that can yield good dividends for the country. And we'll, we'll go with them. If okay. We won't uh, be crying when they bring new taxes. Kojo, let's, let's wrap the conversation in just about two minutes. Uh, just on the international front, so I'll take some headlines. Uh, there's Biden approves more military aid as Ukraine's Zelensky visits Washington, and they're going to get the Patriot surface-to-air missiles uh, for the first time. There's also at least two dead after boat accidents in South Nigeria, and Nigerian troops kill 103 extremist militants in three weeks. That's an official uh, report. The Daily Guide uh, regurgitates some of the stories we've seen already. Gold for oil, 2.5% uh, in VAT. And there's also Ghana, Burkina Faso, stoke fire in fight against terrorism. You would have seen uh, images of our national security minister, Albert Kandapa, with uh, the military leader in Burkina Faso. At least a positive on the back of what has happened in recent times, uh, which some of us uh, still have some concerns about the president's uh, outburst, if you like, in Washington, D.C. But maybe something I'd like us to wrap the conversation with. It appears in a bid to secure money, okay, we're being, this government is willing to tax us in, out of pocket, right, left, center, forward, backwards. I'm talking about the tax clearance that was put forward. If you don't get that clearance, you don't get your driver's license. I don't, I, I don't know whether you followed that and what your yeah, yeah, quick, yeah, yeah. Your quick take is on it, but it was shut down. It's been, it's yeah, been yeah. shut down in Parliament. In, in some 30 seconds, your, your take on that and we wrap. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with the minority who argue that, well, for that poor taxi driver, how is he going to get taxi, uh, tax grants that if, if you say he doesn't have it, it, it can, he cannot renew his license. So I think it was really a non-starter. They shouldn't have gone there. They should look for more creative ways to raise revenue, not to tax everybody and, and anything in this country. I, I don't agree with it. When they were coming to power, mm. they promised us that we we're going to move from taxation to production. That was what we were looking for. Were, I, I'm not sure we've seen much of it, really. So government should go back to how it started, what it promised the people. Less taxes would, would look at increasing productivity 
of production to ensure that we move this country forward. But we are seeing the opposite. So they should go back to their manifesto and look at it, whether they are achieving what they promised or they are deviating. Kojo, thank you so much for making the time en route uh, to interact with us. Always refreshing, even from afar. You've made my Friday. God bless you. God bless you too, man. Uh -huh. And that's Samuel Kojo Brace, my colleague. Uh, right before we veer into sports, a happy birthday to a brother from another mother, Abdul Rahim Edison. Uh, may Allah bless you and I wish you the very best in life. It's from Haruna Mubarak of Joy Sports. Do enjoy your day. Up next, sports. It is a Friday and we are wrapping up the AM sports here, starting from the parliament where the deputy majority leader in parliament, Alexander uh, Afenyo Markin, uh, called on the Minister of Youth and Sports to employ a psychologist for the Black Stars in subsequent tournaments. Ghana exited the 2022 FIFA World Cup group stages after the defeat to Uruguay. In March, the players failed to turn up after Andrea Yu missed a penalty. This appeared disorganized and the Uruguay match with great expectation. They conceded one goal and again they were disorganized. So Mr. Speaker, again I'm not a football fan. I'm not an expert in the area of football. But these observations are very profound and clearly tells you that in our daily lives, how we go about things. Somebody may be sick and will be thinking about the sickness and that will take him to his grave. Even medication will not work. Somebody may be sick, very serious ailment, but because a person has somebody sacking him how to manage the situation, that in itself is healing. And to me, that is where I think our boys did not get. Was it their fault? It couldn't have been their fault. So, Honorable Minister of Sports, Honorable Minister for Youth and Sports, please, going forward, a psychologist, a professional one, a one who understands his work and the nature of football and an important game like that must be properly engaged to support. And Mr. Speaker, saying this to football, I will say it to us as parliamentarians. We sit here, we don't have communication specialists advising us what to say and what not to say. We don't have psychologists managing our exploits in public service. Well, uh, despite having a strong start with the Black Stars and uh, former club AS Roma, striker Felix Afinajan has endured a difficult period in the last four months. The striker was dropped from the final 26-man squad after failing to earn a starting spot following his transfer from Roma to Cremonese. Some Ghanaian football pundits have criticized the decision of the 19-year-old, but within his camp, there is full belief that he will be back in grand fashion. Joy Sports Haruna Mubarak has got the rest in the following story. Mkhitaryan, Mkhitaryan, and it's tucked away by the teenager. Afenagian scores for Roma. Two goals to ultimately win a match for Roma. It was a mark that catapulted him into the senior national team of Ghana, the Black Stars, under then coach Otto Ado. Afenagian was instrumental in Ghana's World Cup qualification and Afghan qualifiers against Madagascar and Central African Republic. Gideon makes his ball in and does a second goal. It's a debut goal for Felix Afinajan. A boy living his dream. Then the things changed. His move to Cremonese in the summer has not been fruitful from failing to compete for a starting spot to being dropped from Ghana's 26-man squad for the 2022 World Cup, raising criticisms from various pundits, with many accusing his representatives of chasing money. His agent explains 
what necessitated the move. Moreno gave Afinado opportunities for a purpose, for some reasons, okay? And then after Roma's um, system or Roma's um, uh, philosophy for the next season, the, the following season changed. It wasn't the same. Yeah. You saw that Roma brought in a uh, ballot. You saw that Roma brought, you know, Roma the tried Bala and all the big... The Bala brought in the Bala. Brought, so the philosophy changed, okay? So it wasn't... Time for the Afina, but Afina still has is young. He still has a lot of time. He still has a lot of opportunity. So go back to Cremona, play, and then get in up there. He can go back to Roma. He can go back to AC Milan. He can go to all the big to be ready to play. Unfortunately, we went to Cremona and things did not go the way we planned it. Since his departure to the newly promoted Serie A side, Afina Jan has played eight times in all competitions and netted one goal. There is a huge concern about the future of the forward after such a good start to his footballing career. But deep within his camp, there is no cause for alarm. For me, I still believe in that move. I don't think that it was a wrong move. Okay, it was just that things did not go as planned because of other issues that I might not be able to say here. And I still believe that we would, we would come... We would come we we'll come back strong. Um, the boy understands. We all um, know where we are. And the boy agreed on the move to Cremona. And he's, we're still together. We still understand. And we still believe in what we have done and know that the boy will get back to his form. Cremonese will welcome Juventus when the Serie A resumes on January 4, 2023. An opportunity for Afenajan to arrest his slumping form. Away from football, Ghana's Winter Olympian, Kwesi Frimpong, says he has never had the privilege of speaking to the Minister of Youth and Sports and anyone at the ministry, despite his efforts to ensure that he puts the country on the map. About a week ago, Kwesi Frimpong became the first African athlete to win a medal in Winter Olympics. He says maybe his efforts have not been valued by the people who are in charge of the government of sports in the country. As of now, since I've started the sport, there hasn't been specifically um, any uh, support from the government itself. When I say that, I mean that I, I've never received any support from the, from the Ministry of Sports, for example, or um, from any of that area. I've always you know, tried to uh, do it all through sponsorship, 100%. I have been a recipient from the IOC Olympic Scholarship, which was in support of the Ghana Olympic Committee, who signed it off, who helped me get that. Um, so three years before the Olympic Games, you get um, a little support to be able to train. Unfortunately, uh, it's a great opportunity. It's very helpful because every little thing helps, but it doesn't cut what you need for budget-wise to be able to hire some of the best coaching and to be able to compete against the big nations. So that has always been a struggle. Um, I know that there is a lot of other athletes that also need support, need help, but I've always tried to push it through sponsorships and eventually it becomes tough, uh, right? When you're representing a nation and when you are trying to put your country on the map, these, these sponsors, they're also looking at that as well. Uh, for example, some of the sponsorship I had from the Netherlands, you know, they feel like you're not really doing much for the Netherlands right now. Um, and so for them, it becomes a little bit of a tricky thing of, um, of a market value where they feel like, you know, yeah. the market is more in Africa, the market is more in Ghana, rather than, uh, you know, the market being the Netherlands for them as an individual representing Ghana. <laughs> um, you know, I hope, that, I hope that there's value in what I'm doing. I hope that he has seen what I've done, um, how I'm representing Ghana. I've never talked to the Minister of Sport before in my life from Ghana. I don't, I know of him, but I've never talked to him personally. Never has there been a message uh, towards me after winning a bronze medal last week for Ghana on the winter sport, the very first time ever. All the fact that I just became the first African ever in history to have a podium finish in the world championship in winter sport of all Africa out of 1.4 billion people. And I, up to the day of today, never heard of the Minister of Sports. So to me, um, I don't know why, uh, but maybe I'm not worth it. And maybe I'm not delivering any value to them. Ghana Bad Maintenance Association, Evans Yeboah, says 
the Federation has achieved its objectives for the year 2022. Jasmine speaking to Joyce Wars. 22 was, was, was a marvelous success because we had a peak of our 2024 10-year uh, national high performance program. And the peak of it was that we were selected into the Commonwealth Games uh, in Birmingham. Uh, so largely, if you look at Birmingham, all the 64 countries which were represented in the male division, uh, Ghana Badminton was 17th out of the 64 countries that played badminton at the highest level of Commonwealth of Nations. When you look at the female section, Ghana Badminton was ninth uh, out of the 37 uh, female countries, that uh, female uh, contingent across all the 72 nations that came. So, so for us, it was, it was showing the success of our, our junior and our senior high performance program. Again, we continue with our coaching development. We continued even last week uh, with our development workshop where we invited all our uh, regional and stakeholders to plan for 2023. And it was also a success. So for us, it's been involving and engaging. Our all Ghana national championship we held in July was also massively attended by the highest number of more than 200 athletes. Uh, again, it shows our prowess and the things that Ghana Badminton is doing uh, for a good year come 2023. That's your AM Sports, uh, but we do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. The show continues right after this run of messages. Well, thank you for staying with us on the AM show. After sports, we get into my blunt thoughts for you today. And this is going to be the last for the year. We all need to get some rest, don't we? This morning, I'm going to go a tad softer, but still share with you a lot that we can reflect on as a people. I've titled my blunt thoughts, learning from the best to be better than the rest. Shining examples Ghana can follow. I want to reiterate that, that title. Learning from the best to be better than the rest. Shining examples Ghana can follow. Ghana for we are in fact a great nation. Like the finance minister Ken Oforiata put it, right before we went knocking on the IMF's doors. After all, our name, Ghana, means land of the warrior king. But we haven't attained the true height of our greatness yet because of our own ineptitude of crass leadership that yields little and purports to do much. That kind of leadership we must go past if we are to become all that we can. This is a challenge I'm throwing to young people especially as we approach elections in 2024. Use your heads and do not allow any member of parliament or member of the executive to buy your vote and by extension your conscience because that will come back to bite you and all of us hard. Let me touch briefly now on the economy. Mr. Kano Foriata, you've successfully created the impression with this debt exchange program fiasco, as far as pension funds are concerned, that arm twisting is the only language government truly understands. Kano Foriata, hey, Aiko, so what do you See a two for no NTR and such a I suppose there will be a lot more arm twisting in store for you and your government as you still refuse to listen in so many ways, some of which I shall point to shortly. Your push for the withdrawal of the e-levy threshold has been jettisoned. Your 80 million Ghana CD vote for the National Cathedral with nothing to back up what it would be used for has also been thrown out. Now you've stepped aside from using pension funds. Thank God. But I ask... Lessons learned? Who knows? Only time will tell. In the meantime, the producer price inflation has now hit 78.1%, causing even more price hikes. This is incredibly problematic, especially considering that inflation is now 50.3%. In the midst of all this, 
you wanted to touch pension funds, knowing very well that some 82% of Ghanaians contribute just a paltry sum of about 150 Ghana cities as pension monthly. And President Okufuado was also on the back of the National Cathedral Project calling us Sambalat and Tobias because some of us are opposed to that needless elephantine project at a time like this. Go ahead, Mr. President, call me Sambalat, call me Tobias. It wouldn't change much. It's about conscience and where we find ourselves as a country. Anyway, we thank our parliamentarians, especially the minority side, for saving us that ignominy. All that said, let me share with you what other countries are doing, which we as Ghanaians can tap into. Now, I'm going to be very fair. Sometimes I use examples and people say, oh, but that is Malaysia. Oh, that is Singapore. Oh, that is South Korea, though they started just like us. I'm going to give you examples, shining examples from right here in Africa. Things that we can emulate, make the most of. And Mr. President, I know you watch me. If next year we can put some of these into practice, believe me, Ghana will be a much better country. Come with me. Let's start with our focus on Ghana's imports. In 2020, rice was Ghana's third highest import third highest, with a whopping import value of $391 million, only behind refined petroleum and car imports. Like you can see from this bar graph or chart, $662 million for refined petroleum, cars with $492, but if you want to add delivery trucks, then the number will shoot up even higher than refined petroleum. But look in there, you would have uh, coated flat rolled iron and that's another area we should be looking at especially as we industrialize that is money we could have saved but prominent in there rice 391 million dollars what we could have done with that is something all of us can just imagine but why am i bringing that up because i'm going to be citing examples from different african countries to show why we need to adopt what they are doing nigeria's ban on rice imports when did this come into force? 2015. There was reduction in imports by 98.4% in seven months. 98.4%. Go back to the previous chart. 391 million. If we we're saving even 95% of this, can you imagine what savings that would be to our country? And it's not that we don't have the capacity. We do. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what it means. Nigeria's rice imports and our source the Thai Rice Exporters Association. It fell from 957 metric tons to 15. Look at the difference. And they achieved that. Why not us? Mr. President, it can be done. Call on the Agri Minister. Let's do this. How about Tanzania? It has canceled Independence Day celebrations three times. For good reason. Tanzania has cancelled Independence Day celebrations three times and diverted funds for more profitable projects. More profitable projects, Mr. President. 2015, John Magufuli, while he was still alive, he used it for the construction of a road. We don't know exactly how much was involved, but they used it to construct a road. In 2020, John Magufuli again cancelled Independence Day celebrations, $360,000. They used it to purchase medical facilities uh, to fight cholera, medical equipment to fight cholera. And the facilities also benefited. In 2022, the new leader, Samia Suhulu Hassan, has cut off 445,000. They are not going to have an Independence Day celebration. And that was diverted into the building of eight dormitories for primary schools. I ask, Independence Day 2023, March the 6th, what exactly are we going to celebrate? No, I'm, I'm asking an honest question. You watching me on TV. What exactly are we going to celebrate? The money we're going to expend on that, we can expend like these countries are doing. Nigerian example, Tanzanian example. Let's move further. In 2015, Tanzania's president, like I mentioned, also ordered the cost of a party. A party, yo. In this country, we get Eurobonds and we throw a Kenke party. Eurobond, then we throw a party. I'm sure SLA, no crying, or staff level agreement, we wanted to throw a party, but people were, so for shaky reasons, them chalk. If we get that IMF deal, I don't want to see any partying. We are not in the best of places. In 2015, Tanzania's president ordered the cost of a party to inaugurate the new parliament to be slashed from $100,000 to $7,000. Thinking sentient leadership. 
Now, Tanzania's government subsidy of petroleum prices, it doesn't end there. Look at the fuel price stability fund. Do you know why I'm bringing this up? Because we also have a fund. Yet the money that was meant to stabilize us so that we wouldn't feel the hits in our pockets on the back of rising fuel prices. That money has been expended elsewhere. So we can't account for it. A hundred billion shillings was what was on the fund. The date introduced June the 1st, 2022. And the effect on fuel prices, every liter. There was a reduction since it was introduced by 110 shillings. If we had used those resources that we have in our pool for the right purpose, we wouldn't have felt the bite like we have. Christmas wouldn't be as bad as it is for some of us. Now, Togo. So I've spoken about Nigeria. I've spoken about Tanzania. Let's go to neighboring Togo. Cushioning consumers against the inflation. The amount spent by government per month has been $20 million and still going on. $20 million. What have they channeled that in? Targeted goods. Wheat, corn, and fuel. Now, this is crucial. Wheat, of course, because of the bread and all of that, you've seen the prices of bread. I don't need to talk about it. The price of a loaf of bread is more than the minimum wage. Think about that. Corn. It's a staple. Your banku, your everything, practically kenke. We use it. Even for feed, for poultry. And now you know how the poultry industry is suffering. Look at that. They, they focused on that. And fuel. Why can't we think and do some of these things? Rwanda has raised the requirement for religious leadership. And I'm bringing this to the, the attention of the authorities so that we can think. Sometimes too, there's too much religiosity. And some of what we do here is inimical to our fortunes as a country rather than to, to help us. Look, in Rwanda, as a progressive society, churches and mosques were closed due to disciplinary issues. Why can't we do that here in Ghana? What are we afraid of? More than 700 of them were shot. In terms of the new clerical requirements, it was stated that you would require a university degree. Eh, university degree before you can, you know, set up a church and do all that. And the purpose was to bring order among churches. I believe this is something we can do here too. Let's regulate our society. Let's have a better society. Because sometimes the religiosity becomes a nuisance in our country. It is good. Religion is very good. But some of the way it is practiced here is just fleecing people. And I don't want to mention names, but we know the situation. My dear friends, as we wrap, how about tourism? Rwanda signed a deal with European football giants. Again, something we can tap into. The period 2019 to 2023 for the purpose of promoting tourism. We talk about the National Cathedral. These are practical things we can do to promote tourism. The deal arrangements, Paris Saint-Germain, is to promote Rwandan tourism and Rwandan products through kits and stadium branding. The deal value $9 million to $11 million for three years. The previous deal was with Arsenal Football Club, $10 million per year, and it's still ongoing since 2018. The benefits, and this is where I, I take a lot of solace, more than 100% marketing benefits and a 5% increment in visitors yearly. 5% more visitors to Rwanda every year. Is this something we think we cannot do? And let's wrap. This is my final bit. We've, some of us have spoken about free SHS, free SHS. It is a good thing. But how you're handling it? Recently, I heard that the World Bank was helping us review free SHS. We need the World Bank to come and tell us to do that. We can't listen to ordinary Ghanaians. But look at the Kenyan example. Maybe that should throw some light on the situation. Free secondary education in Kenya. They started before us from the year 2008. Now for day schools, parents are obliged to pay about 23% of the total. 23%. What stops us from doing that for day students? And for boarding schools, parents pay all fees with some government subsidy. All the fees are borne by uh, parents with a little subsidy by uh, parents. So you see, when we say some of these things, it's not out of air. It's out of practical thinking. And what examples other countries are setting. Today, I wanted to set aside this session of Bland Thoughts for us to reflect as a country on what other, other countries, neighboring countries in Africa, Nigeria, 
Tanzania, Rwanda, Togo, Kenya are getting right that we are not. So as I end, voters in 2024 will determine where next our country will head. Between now and then, though, we must exact from our leaders, and I use the word exact because they refuse to willingly deliver what they must, the right policies and execution we need in order that our woes are not compounded even further and our burdens are not added to. My name is Benjamin Akaku. I say all these things not out of mischief, but because I am an extremely passionate Ghanaian, extremely passionate about Amagana and what her future, intricately tied to ours, holds. These are my blunt thoughts served for you, raw, hot, unedited, and undiluted. God richly bless our motherland and make her great and strong. Well, thank you very much for staying with us on the AM show. And Parliament is on recess. Members of Parliament uh, have been voting on a number of issues at this current sitting. They passed the e new e-levy, which has been reduced to 1%, uh, which with a daily threshold of 100 Ghana CDs uh, retained. They also had uh, the VAT increased by 2.5%. The appropriations bill has also been passed. And interestingly, in the, the National Cathedral issue, we'll be talking about all of those and the debt exchange program as well, for which now the pension funds will be exempt. Well, joining us uh, for those conversations, we have a string of guests who will be uh, participating in this conversation. Al Hassan Suini is Member of Parliament, Tamale North. Samir Bing ex is Executive Director, Parliamentary Network Africa. Eugene Wachi MG, uh, he's been in the news a lot lately. He is the member of parliament for Subin constituency and Dr. Kwesi Amache is a political scientist. And with me in the studio, the evergreen, <laughs> Bernice Abu Good Maybe morning. Maybe ever blue, because today I'm wearing something blue. Good morning to you. How are you doing? <laughs> Charlie, this morning, uh, on a more serious note. But the body has reached its limit here. Eh? It has past its limits. Oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. The mileage on it this year has been... Uh, it's been an intense year. The French would year. say epuisé. I am not tired. I am beyond tired. Mm. I'm something... But yeah, it's, forgotten it's, country. Yeah, it's been quite an intense year. I mean, even considering all that we've been through as a nation. If you look at how we started the year and all the drama and, yeah. the, <laughs> and the fluctuations and everything... Look, but hey, we're here, aren't we? And so it's a good time to reflect, give thanks. And that's why we are having this conversation this morning as Parliament goes on recess to talk about the major happenings and uh, all the drama in, in Parliament as well. This year, we, we've seen quite some activity in Parliament, haven't yeah. we? This and eighth he, Parliament has been yeah. exciting. It's, yeah. it's a political scientist's dream. Mm, I know. Split right down the middle with one moving this side, the Fomena MP second deputy speaker, and everything else from the E-Levy voting to... And, and we're still seeing it. Yeah. We're still seeing it. Okay, so you want us to do this for you, take out this 80 million for the National Cathedral. The threshold for the E-Levy must remain. Must and, remain. and you can tell that if these, these numbers were not in place in Parliament, obviously the majority would have just run... Rough shot. Most likely. Over, over, you know, most, the process. Most likely. But, it, but like I anyway. said, so you need some rest, you know. Um, and I'll be getting into, it. Going into the weekend. And even for you, on, on, okay. on Monday, we have the Joy FM family party in the park. And it's going to be exciting from 9 a.m. till you say, I'm tired. I can't have this anymore. So just, it's 100 cities for a family of six, Benjamin. Uh, yeah, that's just... This is the don't me price. <laughs> Anyway, right. so we'll get into the conversations, and uh, Bernice, I know you're looking forward to it. We have our guests lined up, uh, Hassan Suini, Samir Obeng. We have um, Honorable MP, the Subin MP, and we also have Dr. Kwesi Amachi. Let me start with you. Uh, maybe I should start with the parliamentarians, since you are going on recess. Uh, Mr. Suini, let, let me just, let's just do a mic check, if you'd like. Uh, Mr. Suini, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, my brother. Hope you are well. Good morning to your uh, crew and your viewers as well. Right. Uh, we, we are well, definitely. God has been gracious to us. Once you see us here. We thank uh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Parliament is on recess, but it's been a hubbub 
of activity uh, from the appropriations bill, which you have uh, given assent to, to some of the other happenings. Now, last, the last time the finance minister was in parliament, there was talk about the National Cathedral and um, the, the funding now is supposed to go into infrastructure roles. But I would like to find out fr from you, what has been your assessment, I'll, I'll put that to both of you members of parliament, of this eighth parliament in the year 2022. If I asked you to give me a summary of how the House has performed, what would you say? Well, um, maybe in one sentence, I'll say it is beginning to find its way uh, onto living up to the expectations of many uh, Ghanaians. Uh, it started on a jittery note, uh, and as it was expected because uh, the composition of this parliament is like we have never had before. It's uh, unique, and it also, in its uniqueness, um, brought about uh, higher expectations among the Ghanaian people, justifiable so. But right. um, because it was also unique, um, members had to, uh, if you like, grope in the dark. And uh, along the line, begin to even, you know, introduce things that are not uh, or were not anticipated by those who first drafted the uh, standing orders and all. Uh, but if you look at what we have been able to achieve in 2022, I'll say that uh, finally, it looks like we are beginning to get a grip on it and we are beginning to, uh, you know, uh, perhaps be more clearer with how we approach things uh, to the understanding of uh, the generality of Ghanaians. I mean, for example, when the minority attempted to censure uh, the finance minister, uh, it was, you know, a path that no parliament uh, really has uh, undertaken before. The first time it was tried, uh, it did not get as far as this one got. And so um, it was quite unique. And the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Smana Badwin, uh, deserved tons and tons of commendation for his ability uh, to draw from his experience as the longest, uh, you know, seven member of Parliament to lead the House in these very unique times. Uh, he was able to introduce uh, a procedure uh, that was not anticipated in the uh, censuring of a minister. And that procedure that he's introduced, he introduced uh, helped to uh, clarify uh, the situation better and also got the public more involved in the whole censure motion. At the end of the day, yes, as a minority group, we failed to um, attain our ultimate objective, which was to have uh, the motion, you know, uh, carried, I mean, to have the motion win. But unfortunately, we knew that uh, we needed uh, to third to be able to get that pass. And we also knew we didn't have the numbers uh, to get to third. But we're hoping for a collaboration between uh, our side and the majority side, especially given the fact that uh, some of its members had declared uh, their, you know, uh, disapproval of the finance minister. We thought we were going to get that collaboration. But when uh, it came, came to... Uh, living, or if you like, acting the words that were added. Unfortunately, they developed uh, cold feet and could not join us. But mm. that for me was, uh, in all, all in all, a very, very good uh, process. And it right. has enriched our democracy, it has enriched our parliament, and it has established, you know, um, um, if you like, a standard that will be followed and perhaps improved upon by uh, subsequent parliaments. Right. And, uh, uh, those are some of the reasons why I feel that we are beginning to have a grip on it. And you uh, also, a while ago, uh, went through some of the, uh, you know, uh, give and take uh, that occurred during the consideration of the 2023 budget uh, statement. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible in previous parliament. And I wonder if that uh, can be attained or achieved in future parliaments, especially when, when those parliaments are not, uh, you know, composed in the way that this parliament. 
implement its current right. framework. So we are beginning to take advantage of the unique composition of the eighth parliament uh, to enrich our democracy and enrich our parliamentary practices in mind. Right, right. Mr. Sweeney, uh, I, I'll just put this to you and put it to your colleague MP as well, uh, Mr. Boachi Entry, and then uh, we can move the conversation forward. Bernice will be uh, taking the conversation forward. But I'd like to find out from you, very quickly, these two angles. Your minority leader, Harun Idrisu, said that parliament, he admitted, had failed in some respects. For example, in holding the executive to account, especially in the dispensement or the, the, the I mean, using of funds. And he cites the excessive borrowing in this administration, but also in other administrations. What's your thought on that? And when you're done answering that, I, I hope it's brief, just give me your assessment so far. This eighth parliament, on a scale of one to ten, what score would you give the August House of Parliament? Quick thoughts. Well, um, I lost you at some point, but uh, I will answer based on the understanding that I got. So, so let me do this quickly. Uh, Minority Leader Harun Idrisu has said Parliament has failed in some regard in terms of checking the executive. Part of it, excessive borrowing. How do you react to that? And how would you assess, on a scale of 1 to 10, the 8th Parliament? Very frankly. Well, um, it will be, um, I think that um, too uh, limiting to measure the work of parliament, especially the eighth parliament. You've done something for a while to, now. I'm just asking up to this point, how would you assess it? One to 10? No, I, I, I will get there. I'm saying that if you have been, I'm saying it will be too limited to assess the uh, contribution of parliament, especially this eighth parliament, to just how much a government has voted. I don't think um, it will be fair to assess, you know, the working of parliament and whether it has lived up to expectation uh, merely based on how much it has allowed a government to vote. That's the point I, I seek to make first. Mm. But if the minority leader is, you know, uh, just using that as an example uh, of some of the failings of parliament, then I am unable to disagree with him. Because, yes, they, they, there are other oversight rules that uh, Parliament uh, you know, can still do better in as far as uh, giving the people uh, effective representation is concerned. And I am not one to uh, say that we have been perfect. Parliament can still do better. There's still more room for improvement. But that is not to say that uh, we have not, you know, in the last couple of uh, years, especially in this fourth republic, right. uh, lived up to uh, the bill as, as, as parliament is required. Okay. Yes, there are some shortcomings, and I'm hoping that moving forward, we will rise over those shortcomings. But on the scale of one to 10, I think that as, especially this year, I will give this eighth parliament eight out of 10. Eight out of ten for the eighth parliament. Okay. Especially for this year. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let, let me just take the uh, same thoughts from uh, the Subin MP, Eugene Boache Entry. Uh, a very good morning to you, Mr. Entry. Uh, all right. So we'll try to get Mr. Boache Entry to. Uh, deliver his thoughts. But I'll bring in Sami Obeng, uh, since we started from Parliament, what would be your assessment of the work of the 8th Parliament so far? And on a scale of 1 to 10, what would you be uh, giving them as by way of a score? Thank you, Benjamin. Um, well, the 8th Parliament has gone way into its mandate, you know, two years out of uh, four. And um, we have seen two different years, um, so to speak. You know, we saw a first year where, at the beginning of it, um, citizens had very high expectations of a new parliament that, by the sheer numbers, we knew that uh, it should be able to deliver you know, better than we had seen previous parliaments deliver on, especially on oversight of the executive branch, because we've known that the legislative function of parliament, they've always been able to perform that creditably. But the oversight and then the representation of the people had usually been the, 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 the 
but a shaky note. Many of the high expectations that we had of Parliament did not really materialize in the first session, which is the first year of Parliament. I mean, started on a very terrible, terrible note on the 7th of January, you know, last year, and ended on an even more terrible, I mean, I mean note with all the things that happened with the budget uh, sessions of, of last year. And so you'll recall that we entered into this year with some very, um, uh, gloomy feeling about our legislature and its ability to deliver on its money. I must say that this year has been a bit different. Uh, they've not gotten to where we all expect them to get to. It is halfway, um, half time if we were playing football at the World Cup, um, a good time for them to, you know, uh, take a good uh, 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 rest and, 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 and assess what they themselves have been able to to do, but if you ask me on a scale of one to five, considering all the things that have happened, one to one to ten actually. A scale of one to ten, sorry, considering all the things that have uh, happened from the beginning of Parliament, uh, this eighth Parliament, including the seventh January issue right up to now, and the fact that many of these issues, even we've not brought finality to it, I'll put them around uh, a mid level, so five out of ten uh, for me. Five out of ten, right. Mm. And interesting, Sami. Ben is here. So we've seen uh, some interesting days to Parliament going on recess. Um, talk of the uh, budget and what's been approved so far. We've seen the the shooting down of the 80 million CDs that government was hoping to push towards the National Cathedral project. The e levy. Uh, initially, we were told when the finance minister read the budget that it was now going to be at one percent and the daily threshold was going to be scrapped. But uh, the parliamentarians managed to push against that, though uh, maintaining the 1%, we still have the 100 CD threshold. Uh, how does this all play for you, considering that, like you just said, uh, the expectations of many people was that we will see a more robust parliament, a parliament uh, that wouldn't just be a rubber stump one. How did the last few days uh, turn out for you? Well, um, in fact, I must say that this parliament um, and my five over 10 uh, because of the, the happenings within the last few days. Um, honestly, I think the last few days have shown that there is really, really promise with this eight parliament provided that they can be able to stick to the and deliver what exactly the people of Ghana are expecting them to deliver on. Remember that in the past, what we have had is the eighth parliament raising our expectations so high, telling us about things that they would definitely not compromise on. And then when the votes are cast and when the chips fall, we, we, we recognize how you know uh, they disappoint all of us. We saw that in some ministerial appointment situation. Um, of course, the minority did their best so far as the essential motion is concerned. They did not have the cooperation of the other colleagues, but we've seen that also in many other instances during this eighth parliament. But over the last couple of days, and considering also that, you know, there are some of the things that uh, uh, it is important that we, we mention them so that when Parliament is doing well, we can commend them the same way that we would, you know, uh, 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 they had to spend the entire day on, um, they had to spend the entire day on Wednesday, you know, sitting. And, and it eats into the early mornings of, of, of Thursday. I woke up at around 4 a.m. On, on, on Thursday morning and saw that they were still sitting and just about wrapping up, you know, and you saw all the amazing things going through the uh, recordings of the sitting of that particular day. You mm. saw the amazing things that they were able to do. This shows us that Parliament has so much power. Parliament is able to deliver on a lot of amazing stuff. It puts their minds to it if they both put their shoulders to the wheel there were some of these issues that they agreed to like scrapping the uh, special development initiatives uh, uh, bit like uh, scrapping the secretariat for mnu which were consensus agreements even at the level of the finance committee which meant that both sides you know agreed to it because they realized that these things are duplications these things are not helping us especially mm. in these very dire moments mm. so yes the last couple of days are amazing and for me i say that more of these you know, Parliament, the eighth Parliament, we want to see more of these, really. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Suhini, I'll be coming to you shortly. Uh, apologies no for that. Uh, Mr. Suhini, I'll be coming to you shortly. But, um, Sami, it's interesting you talk about how deep into the night Parliament sat uh, on, on one of uh, 
these f past few days, but there's also a lot of concern about absenteeism. Uh, we've seen uh, organizations like Odikro come up strongly against that. And that reminds me of uh, what you said earlier this year when we were, we were discussing uh, the Adwasafu issue, and you said you would be scandalized if she came back and still retained her seat. Well, as it is now, she's still MP for Dom Kwabinga. Uh, as we assess Parliament uh, in, in, this, in this last uh, sitting, what, what are your thoughts today, seeing that Adrasafo is still where she is and absenteeism is still a big problem in Parliament? Yes, um, one of the things that we are doing at Parliamentary Network Africa, and, and very soon before they, they resume for the third session, we'll be putting it out, is that we're trying to compare the first two years of this eighth parliament to the first two years of previous parliaments, especially when it comes to matters of attendance, when it comes to matters of uh, bills passed, when it comes to matters of actual delivery, you know, because we think that it is important to be able to attach some level of empirical evidence to, 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 to these issues. Because I personally hold the view, having looked through the votes and proceedings of previous parliaments and this one, I really do not think that absenteeism has been a very bad situation in this current parliament as compared to some of the previous, except that this current parliament has also been bold enough to be able to call out some of their own who have not you know, done so well so far as attendance matters is concerned. However, like I told you about the disappointment situation, they raised the temple so high, they, 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 they put uh, Honorable Adjoa Safo and, and two others before the Privileges Committee. They spend a lot of time grilling them, you know, they provide Adjoa Safo, for example, to, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, for the lack of, a, for, for the want of a better word, abuse all of the systems that are in place at committee level for interrogating such matters. And yet, plenary is failing to be able to take these matters forward because of sheer partisan politics. The same way that uh, Speaker, Speaker, Speaker Babin promises about investigating um, the 7th January situation, the, the, mm -hmm. the debacle of 7th January, indicating that leadership is looking into it and they will be coming back to us. 7th January 2023 is just around the corner, two years down the line. We've seen absolutely nothing so far as concluding the matter is concerned. Meanwhile, the appears. In the, in the US legislature had a similar situation around that same time. We've seen how they've been able to, you know, uh, bring some finality, so to speak, on, uh, on the matter, uh, because they've been able to show the citizens that they take some of these matters very, very seriously. And for me, those are the low sides, you know, of these parliaments. If parliament, the eighth parliament particularly, will be able to mop up these low ends, and will be able to focus on some of the great things that they've been able to do in the last couple of days, on this particular budget. Then we will have an eighth parliament that will be an amazing you know, uh, piece to be able to study. Uh, I think Benjamin started by saying that the current eighth parliament is, 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 is an awesome piece for any political scientist you know, studying parliamentary development work. Absolutely, but you see, it goes beyond just what they are doing. We, we need to see more and, 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 and honestly, yes, I am scandalized still about the uh, uh, Honorable MP for Don Kwabinya still being in Parliament. I am, I am particularly disappointed that Parliament has not been able to stamp its feet. You know, when they were, they were going on the last recess, it, it was taken on the very final day. The Speaker promised that, well, we are going to go back. I'll, I'll bring a reasoned, you know, a, a conclusion onto the matter and we'll be able to settle on this. But we, we've still not seen much. It, it's really disappointing. Mm. Talking about political scientists being interested in what's happening in our parliament currently, we have Dr. Kwesi Amachi joining us. Good morning to you, Doc. I, I, I want to believe that you have heard from our two guests. What are your quick thoughts on some of the issues they, they've shared? And for you as a political scientist, would you say that parliament is finally growing to the point uh, of the expectation of Ghanaians or uh, we shouldn't be too excited with what we're seeing? What will the 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 indicators be for you to say that yes we are getting there opportunity and let me say good morning to your viewers and to yourselves and my colleagues um actually what's happening to me isn't something i'll credit parliament itself i'll go back to the people of ghana right who gave us the type of uh, parliament they gave us, meaning that you know people have issues with the performance of parliament, particularly 
deliberation on issues, exercising oversight, responsibility on government. And then, related to this, the, the, the issue that the minority leader relates to, you know, his, his, his uh, claim that, you know, parliament has a hand in, in, in the challenge Ghana has on its hand now is critical. You know, it speaks to the fact that parliament simply relates to issue, Ghanaian issues mm. from positions relatively different from what Ghanaians expect them to have. And for that matter, the, the interests that drive their actions and inactions. Mm. This parliament now beginning to set up, it is not necessarily so. You know, I, I like it that the last speaker feels that he's scandalized by the presence of Ajua Safo in, in the parliament. That tells you the interest that drives, mm. you know, parliamentary activities right. and, 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 and stuff like that. So uh, I think Ghanaians have still got to put a lot of pressure on the parliament to do what we want for us. And, right. and to, to, mm. to do this, simply, parliamentarian, okay. Please, please, if, please if, proceed. If I, should, if I should stop here, otherwise I'll... No, no, please, please proceed. Great. Um, good. Parliamentarians are necessarily afraid of just one thing, the next elections. And so if, if, if they realize that they are going to be punished for taking some actions in parliament and not taking other actions, that they are going to be punished for their actions and inactions in parliament, then they will sit up. As of now, what I see is party-driven, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, party interest driving parliamentary uh, uh, activities. It is still so much uh, with our parliament, uh, rather than, you know, they addressing themselves to issues that, are, that come from concerns of Ghanaians. So that is only how, how I see things. Are they beginning to pick up somehow, somehow, but, but it's not enough. Right. It's not enough at all. Doc, so would you say that Parliament then, especially the majority MPs, lost a fine opportunity uh, to, to cement your point that this was more of a push from Ghanaians and not necessarily Parliament itself? My line is not helping... Hello, Doc, My can you hear me? Helping. I didn't get a question. Hello, yes. Doc, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Great. I'm asking... I can hear you now. I'm asking if Parliament lost a fine opportunity to cement your point about Ghanaians having more representation, as should be the case. And, and I'm speaking specifically to the issue with the, the stay of the finance minister in office. We saw that majority of the MPs of the NPP were asking the president to let him go. And when we spoke to some of them here, they said that is what their constituents wanted. Later, we saw them backtracking and all that. In, in regards to the people having uh, more of an impact on what their represent, representatives do in parliament, how can we work better at that, at achieving that? Uh, that is a critical issue because uh, in one breath, members of the majority claim that they would like the finance minister to go. In another breath, they wouldn't want to go about it the way the minority wanted the issue you know, to be addressed. And, and to me, that's confusion. If I, the finance minister is still you know, in office. How do, we, how do we address this? If indeed it did come from their constituents, the way you know, they claim that they went home and their constituents had issues with that. If indeed that is true, and they were not doing just politics, politics in the MPP, where the uh, members of parliament found an opportunity to free themselves from, I would say, the clutches, the control of the executive. And it's simply to me because of the timing. We get into the end of uh, the tenure of the president, and, and like it happens in almost all democratic jurisdictions, his authority begins to wane. 
now they come in strongly to behave like that. I don't think it did come from their constituents. Otherwise, they couldn't backtrack. You know, they were doing politics as usual, something to benefit themselves. They all have issues with the finance minister, but somehow over the, over the period that the man has been in office, they have had to keep quiet. I like to visit the minority leaders' issue. What happened in parliament supervised over, you know, the, 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 the contracting of the loan facilities? Anytime they came for more, didn't they subject the previous one to scrutiny to tell themselves, I mean, what the money has been used for and whether it's been used, you know, uh, 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 well for Ghanaians. Then they went ahead always to approve, to approve, to approve. And today we are saying that uh, we are not able to manage our, our loans domestically and internationally. Such like that even the IMF is dragging its feet to give us money. How did we get here? What is the role of parliament? Uh, its complicity in this. So all these tell us that parliament has not necessarily been there for the people. They are there for themselves. They are there for their party. What can we do to control that? Elections. Vote the rascals out. That is the only thing in politics. Bring checks and balances to the actions and inactions of members of parliament. Mm. Let me come to you, Mr. Suhini, and thank you so much for holding Hello. on. Um, so this was quite an interesting uh, point in Parliament where the two opposing sides wanted the same thing, yet wanted to use different routes to achieve that. Um, I've, I found out from some of your other colleagues what they felt about that. I'm not sure I've heard your, your thoughts on it. Do you mind sharing with us what you think uh, about the action of your colleagues on the other side with regards to getting the finance minister out of office? Yes, I think that um, what stood in the way of uh, our colleagues on the majority side was uh, partisanship. Otherwise, there's no other way to explain their uh, decision to uh, approach the removal of the finance minister uh, using a different route than the route that we uh, on the minority side chose. If we all wanted the same thing and we were going to rise above uh, partisanship, uh, there was absolutely no reason why we could not collaborate, uh, you know, to um, uh, get the censure motion uh, through. Because uh, like I did explain to some of our colleagues on the majority side, when we negotiated to uh, convince them to join uh, the, 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 the fight, uh, that if you look at the constitution, it is not imperative, it's not mandatory for the president to uh, uh, allow a minister that has been censured to go. The article that is used there is may. The president may uh, act on the censure motion or not. And so when they claim that the president had given them assurance that the man was going to leave office uh, after the budget and after the IMF deal, uh, my position or my you know, uh, point to them was that, yes, um, why don't you make, uh, as we say here, assurance double sure by just joining us to pass the motion of censure? Because mm. the motion once passed will not even compel the president to remove the finance minister the next day. It will still allow him time to do it uh, at the time that he has assured you he will do it. But you are just making assurance double sure by ensuring that you join us to uh, make the motion succeed. But they wouldn't because of partisanship. And so for me, what stood in the way of collaboration between us and our colleagues was just their uh, focus on partisanship and the fact that they did not want it to look like, um, you know, uh, some sort of political victory for the NDC if this motion uh, uh, succeeded. And right. so they just wanted us to, to, to fail with it. But I think that was quite unfortunate because uh, at least, this would have been one of the uh, uh, times that we could have used to demonstrate to people publicly, even though we have so many uh, uh, times where we have collaborated and worked together on. The often cliche is that we only agree to work together when it is about our welfare. Mm -hmm. I think this was a missed opportunity for us to show to the Ghanaian people that uh, we can together 
uh, collaborate in the interest of, 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 of our citizens, especially given the mess in which uh, our uh, economy is in as a result of very uh, clueless and incompetent decisions uh, that have been taken by the economic management team, which unfortunately uh, is peer-headed uh, in terms of implementation by the finance minister. Right, so just a quick one. Um, the president, as we were told by the MPs after their meeting with him, was that they could begin to talk about whether Mr. Oforiata would stay in office after that IMF deal was secured. It wasn't emphatic that he was going to let him go after that. But for you, I mean, looking at what the work you've been able to achieve so far, um, and you scoring 8 out of 10, do you get a sense that the people you as a person, Mr. Suhini, represent are satisfied with the kind of work that is being delivered on the floor of Parliament? Yes, to some extent, Benis. I am not too much in disagreement with uh, Sami's uh, rate when he rates Parliament overall, you know, uh, with a figure of 5 out of 10. Um, remember when I rated eight, I said in relation to this year, 2022. Okay. So I was speaking in specific terms of 2022, how this eighth parliament has performed. But if you broaden it to perhaps how the parliament has performed uh, two years after its composition, I may uh, come down to five or six, just mm. as uh, my brother has done. But in relation to how we have worked this year, uh, I still think that um, we are beginning to uh, get a grip on what is expected of us. And I'm quite confident that my electorates, uh, those who gave me the mandate uh, to represent them in Tamale North, uh, are you know, beginning to appreciate uh, the role that I am supposed to play better, especially when it comes to providing oversight and holding uh, the government to account and also leading development you know uh, in my constituency mm. either by way of initiating uh, same or lobbying for uh, same to be uh, carried out i think that uh, uh, especially when you listen to uh, uh, my brother sami he makes the point that uh, there have been some disappointments in the past and sometimes we raise the aspirations of people and we dash it yes that is true but also in some cases, especially in the beginning, it was because of the misunderstanding of the parliamentary process. And so if you said things that you were going to do within your capacity and it was not properly understood, even when you delivered within your capacity, it was still seen as a mark of failure. For example, uh, before now, uh, perhaps people would not have appreciated the fact that uh, the minority on its own did not have the capacity to censure a minister. And so they would have held the minority responsible for a failure of, uh, you know, uh, the motion that was seeking to censure the, the minister. But over the period and through discussions, people are beginning to know the capacity of the minority. And so, for example, when you had the situation with the appointments committee, the appointments committee had recommended uh, uh, some ministers uh, uh, for approval and others for disapproval, if, if, if I'm permitted to, to put it that way. Yet, when the plenary, uh, in its wisdom, uh, decided to vote for those ministers to remain in office, the appointment committee mm. and its members still came under attack. Because right. people perhaps at the time did not understand the, the, the different working, work, I mean, working uh, procedures in Parliament. So clearly, with this central motion, I think the clarity was there that as a minority, we did not have the two-third that is required to censure the minister, but we're willing to undertake the process, hoping that we get collaboration from our colleagues on the majority side. We mm. did not have that collaboration, and the motion failed, and the minority is not held responsible for the failure of the motion. Generally, it is believed that the, the move in itself has enriched our democratic pra practice. Right. Uh, on, that, uh, uh, on, that, on that particular issue of the motion and how it went about, your, your chief whip, Muntika Mubarak, has, has said that the Speaker of Parliament is becoming a tyrant. He, he says he's turning Parliament into a palace. He actually 
compares him to his predecessor, Mr. Michael Cray, and says that Prof, I beg your pardon, Prof Michael Cray was better when it came to consensus building. Your quick thoughts on that, and then we can move on with the other guests. Well, I, I will not know all the bases upon which the majority, I mean, minority chief whip, uh, you know, came to the conclusion that he came to. Uh, whatever it is, I think that it was unfortunate that he, you know, made it public, even if uh, he had any basis uh, whatsoever uh, to come to that conclusion. I still think that uh, given the channels of communication, especially within parliament and outside parliament within the National Democratic Congress, I still feel that uh, the, 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 it could have been handled in a better way, even if he had any basis to come to that conclusion. I mean, at the level of leadership, uh, a lot of uh, negotiations, a lot of communication takes place. And so he's in a better place to know if Professor Michael Quaid, you know, builds consensus more than uh, Speaker Batman. What I do know personally is that there have been uh, periods that I have had frustrations with, uh, you know, the way uh, Speaker Batman has gone about things uh, on the floor. Personally, I've had, you know, serious frustrations. But uh, most times, uh, with time and upon hindsight, I appreciate. I come to appreciate the wisdom with which he handled uh, the things that he uh, handled in the manner that he did, which gave me frustration. So, uh, but I, like I've said, I'm not in a position to have all the details that uh, Muntaka Mubarak may have had, for which reason he came to the conclusion that uh, he came to. And I, I, I will, I will, I will say he is entitled to that position based on perhaps the information that he may have that is not available to me. Well, he, he, ba he basically, he say. basically spoke about the creation of a committee to hear the central motion before the the, the report was brought to the floor of parliament. Right, Venice, so, Venice, Venice, and like I said, I mean, there have been times that the speaker has taken decisions that I have had uh, issue to. Uh, I've had issues with. I have felt frustrated by the way uh, he went about taking the decisions in, 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 the, in the manner that he did. For example, uh, when he uh, uh, referred the finance minister to this ad hoc committee uh, with co-chair persons, I was uncomfortable on the floor. And even though I did not have, I did not catch his eye, my frustration, you know, was visible. And uh, maybe if the cameras captured it, uh, uh, it will bear me out. I was not at that point convinced that it was the right thing to do. And somehow I am still not very convinced that uh, it was the, you know, procedure that should have been uh, uh, used per our standing orders. But I also have come to understand that uh, the procedure is not too clear when it comes to uh, uh, a motion to censure a minister. It's not too clear. Uh, so my understanding may be different from Speaker Bagwin's understanding. And for him, this was an opportunity to establish a clear procedure when it comes to censuring, you know, a minister. I mean, it is clear when you are doing it for a speaker and a president or a vice president. But with the minister, it is not too clear in our standing orders and in the constitution. So for him, it was an opportunity to establish a clear procedure. Right. And having followed the, the uh, later, when I followed the committee's work, I saw the wisdom in why he did that. I may have had frustrations in the beginning when he did that, but when I followed the work of the uh, committee, I think we could have taken advantage of it more than we did as a minority group. But I also saw the wisdom in why, you know, the committee uh, was established. And, right. and, and so for that matter, I do not really fault the speaker on it. And that wisdom you talk about, sorry, Benjamin will come through shortly. I, I want to know what right. it is. What was it that convinced you that this was a wise decision taken by the speaker? Well, you see, the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, in, in censuring a minister, the constitution and our standing orders require you to give the minister the opportunity to be heard. Now, what is not stated clearly is how he can be heard. For example, if he wants to be heard through a council, it is not properly, you know, uh, stated in the constitution or the standing orders. If you, uh, I mean, how to allow a council to represent the minister if he wants to be heard through a council. But if he wants to be heard 
as a minister. The minister is already, uh, you know, a non-voting member of parliament and so can be heard on the floor in the course of the debate of a motion to censure him. The minister personally, if he wants to be heard, can be heard. But if he wants to be heard through a lawyer, through a counsel, it is not clear because the lawyer is not a non-voting member of parliament. And I mean, assuming the lawyer is not a non-voting member of parliament, the, that such a lawyer will not have space on the floor of parliament to, 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 to represent the minister. And so giving the minister the opportunity to appear before, uh, you know, the ad hoc committee that was created with his counsel, I thought was wise, was a wise decision because that lawyer would not have had space on the floor of parliament to, you know, represent the minister in the manner that he did before the committee. So I think it was a wise decision. And I also thought that it was another way of, you know, involving the public because if you notice the committee advertised its sittings and even requested you know people who are interested in the matter to also appear with evidence and i think that was also a mark of uh, wisdom which has enriched our democracy because if we're just to debate the motion in parliament uh, such individual i mean individuals and organizations such as uh, uh, piak and others would not have had space to contribute to you know the motion on right. the floor the right. way that they had the opportunity mm. to contribute before the committee so all in all i personally had frustrations when it was first referred to the committee but when i followed the sentence uh, uh, i saw the wisdom in in why speak about right G gentlemen let, let me come in at this juncture i'd like to run this by all three of you starting with dr amachi i just want your brief take on the pros and cons of having a hung parliament, so to speak, like we do. We have a majority side, a minority side, but it's very close. If you look at what happened, the vote, uh, one of the recent votes in parliament uh, from yesterday, it was 135 to 136, okay? I'd like to find out from you what you think the pros and cons have been, maybe with a bit of a focus on the negatives, because we've seen quite a bit of the positives. Dr. Amachi. Uh... Focusing on the negatives, this will, to me, be the issue of time. You know, the issue of time that will go into uh, Parliament's ability to decide uh, on an issue and bring finality to it. In the, I, th I, think, I think that will, will be the only thing. Otherwise, uh, it is so good because uh, they are forced to come into consensus. And, and, and that will reflect the, the interest of society anytime parliament works by consensus, by accommodation, cooperation. Societal interest gets saved. For you, Mr. Obeng. Oh, but, but, but before Mr. Obeng uh, comes in, so, so the positives, Dr. Amachi, just to highlight, what would be the standout positive for you? The fact that they are able to uh, push the majority to the wall and maybe get decisions reflective of the masses, uh, what would it be before Samuel Bain comes through? Dr. Amachi? No, it's just like I said, serving societal interest when it okay. has to be. All right. Yeah. All right. Sammy? Yes, Benjamin. Uh, um, let me first start by saying that the situation we have could have been worse when it comes to the outputs it delivers. If we look at situations of other countries even within the region, West Africa region, that has experienced hung parliament. You know, the last five years in the parliament of Sierra Leone has been very chaotic because the ruling party did not have majority in that particular parliament. And, and so for those of us who, by, by the nature of our work, study parliaments and the way they work in different jurisdictions, we know that even this, our situation, could have brought more chaos than we had experienced. So it could have been worse. I, I just think that I needed to establish that. I mean, in, in, in those other jurisdictions, because people wanted to play politics and get the numbers, there were arrests of members of parliament, left, right, center, you know, all manner of, you know, uh, 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 scandalous things happening, you know. And, and, and remember that we, we, we had, uh, uh, some, some people had even, you know, warned that we could have such instances where, because of the sheer numbers, people may play games with the numbers and may want to, you know, uh, harm individual members of parliament just so that the numbers will favor one party or the other. However, having said that, 
it is instructive to note that some of the negatives that this brought is that it exposed the non-readiness of the standing orders of parliament itself and the systems and structures that are existent in parliament towards a situation like this you know uh, and for me it it is good that Parliament is in the process of reviewing its standing orders. This is a this is a time for them to be able to use the lessons and learnings from all of the things that they've in the last few years to better improve, you know, um, the standing orders of Parliament. Another thing that it exposed, which also comes to the negative, is that it has shown that parliamentarians, especially those of them at leadership, have not built that consensus building mentality well enough. Because this is the best time for consensus, you know. His Excellency the President in his inaugural speech for his second term indicated that, you know, he thinks that the Almighty God had given us this kind of parliament because he thinks God wants, you know, both parties to work together. Unfortunately, both parties have not exhibited their abilities or in some instances willingness to work together, you know, in a collective towards the common good uh, of Ghana. So that has also been... Been, been been exposed uh, during this period of course the the the, the 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 it has also exposed the fact that parliament in itself you know sometimes do not hold its own to account for which reason its own sometimes feel that they are empowered to do all manner of things so that because nobody was held to account on the 7th of january 2021 incidents right. people decide it would budget period and what have you. However, there are some positives. You know, for me, one of the notable positives is that in the last two years, our budget processes have not been the same. You know, and for me, that is good. Uh, 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 the power of the PES function that Parliament has to play uh, uh, in, in appropriating funds for the executive to use have been significantly different in the last two years than we have seen in the past. And that is a very, very good milestone for this eighth parliament. However, right. there certainly is still more room for improvement. Uh, Al Hassan, you, you are there, you're in the thick of things. From what you've seen, what, what do you think have been the pros and the, the cons briefly on, on that point? Because there's a lot more I'd like to nail down uh, subsequently. Let, let's hear from you. Sir. Well, I, I, I think that, um, like you indicated, the pros may be uh, widely known uh, by many. Uh, the fact that uh, you tend to have uh, the major, the minority not really having its say, but in some cases having its way uh, is quite uh, unique about this parliament. And I have said uh, from day one that uh, as a country, we should uh, be able to take advantage of this unique composition of parliament uh, to make it uh, a parliament of reference for the future. Uh, because I do not think Think that uh, we will get the same composition uh, maybe in the next decade or two. Uh, the worst that can happen now, I have said repeatedly, is to have um, you know a government forming minority uh, in parliament. Uh, but we have seen how in the past uh, governments with uh, majority have bullied uh, parliament and made it a uh, robust term. Uh, what we haven't seen is this equal numbers and i'm saying it doesn't look likely that we'll have that you know for a very long time to come and that is why we must take advantage of this eighth parliament to make it a parliament of reference and in the first year uh, it didn't look good but i am becoming hopeful that uh, we are beginning to uh, you know get our grip together i keep repeating that because it's very very important to me that right. we are beginning to get our grip and hopefully we will be able to uh, establish this eighth parliament as a parliament uh, of, of of reference so uh, uh, in terms of the, the the things that haven't really uh, worked out well because of the uh, numbers that we have uh, maybe uh, on the government side they will complain about delay uh, because sometimes these days uh, before they even introduce something they need to engage more they need to consult more uh, and all of that and so it may be seen as a negative but for me uh, as a governance watcher i think that uh, it is good for good governance because uh, more channels of communication is opened and more engagement leads to better policies right uh, the president yes uh, Sami made reference to his opening uh, his inaugural speech unfortunately he has not demonstrated 
you know, uh, 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 leadership enough as far as the need for building consensus is concerned. Uh, I do know uh, that he uh, hardly reaches out to the main players, you know, in the opposition. He hardly does that. Uh, even when he does, he does through, you know, agents that can be trusted and all of that. And you recall last year, his, his remark at the party's conference in Kumasi after the appropriation was part, passed for the budget uh, led to uh, tensions uh, which eventually culminated even in the delay uh, in the passage of the e -Lady because uh, leadership of the House had built consensus uh, to get the appropriation passed without major resistance, despite the fact that the minority initially had indicated that they were going to uh, oppose uh, uh, appropriation. Uh, but when the party had a conference the weekend after the appropriation was passed in Kumasi, the president, you know, gave marching orders to the majority and indicated that he was hearing noise that there was no majority in parliament and that his group uh, constituted the majority and they must go and pass the e -Levy. And so right. it just unnecessarily, uh, you know, heated the house up and, and did not vote, you know, mm. well for let, 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 let. Right. Let, let me bring in some other angles in terms of money, the purse of the state, and uh, some of where we're heading. So two issues uh, to start with that I want to run by you. The first has to do with Parliament cutting off some 17 million CDs. And I'll start with you, Dr. Amachi. I'll go to each one of you on this. Parliament cutting some 17 million CDs from the original allocation to the Office of uh, Government Machinery. We're talking about... Uh, the budget slashed for the special development initiatives, monitoring and evaluation secretariat, all of those has been cancelled, about 17 million Ghana CDs off. Then you, you look at the National Cathedral and the 80 million uh, Ghana CD allocation that was made to it. Interestingly, there, there, there was no proper justification, not from the finance ministry, not from the tourism ministry. I don't know how it ended up under tourism though. But what, what do these... Uh, make in terms of statements, uh, Dr. Machi, and maybe you can add your thoughts about the National Cathedral specifically and where it's headed. We were told about seed money. I think I'll start with Samir being on that. We were told about seed money, and now seed money has become a sum that no one knows what, what it will extend to by stretch of money. Uh, Samir being, would you like to start for us? Yes, uh, for me, the biggest statement uh, is that our elected legislators um, have shown that they, they cannot be like us, who only have platforms such as this and our respective social media platforms to vent and to complain. For them, beyond the complaint, there are tools for them to actually take action, you know, because uh, some of the things that, you know, are happening in our country that has plunged us into uh, uh, the situation we currently find ourselves, you know, some of them could have been avoided and some of them could have been avoided if the people's representatives, you know, uh, 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 put their foot to the ground as strongly as they are doing now. You know, special development initiative secretariat under the office of the president around this time, extremely needless, you know, uh, 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 when you have constituted by members from both sides, you know, indicates their unwillingness to be able to give money to fund that particular secretariat, then you are happy. You know, in this era where we are, we are, we are, we are sinking so badly, you know, Christian as I am, you know, would this be the best time for a national cathedral? The people are speaking and the people are saying, no, this is not the best time for, for it. Yes, the cathedral is necessary, but this may not be the best time for it, especially when we've been told that public money was not going to be used and that it was going to be funded purely through private donations and that the public was only going to donate some form of assets you know, to, to, to this cause. And so, yes, when you have your legislature stamping its feet in this particular area, it sends a very strong signal. Not only that, we heard about the Office of the Special Prosecutor and how they've been starved of funds. And we saw the move by Parliament to the extent that they insisted that the Ministry of Finance brings a letter confirming that it is willing to pay off the arrears before some of the things that the ministry also expects through the appropriation will go through. And the ministry had to oblige, you know, so now they can be able to 
uh, take the minister to the government assurances committee if he fails on that particular uh, uh, bit. This is how parliaments can 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 um, uh, stand in for the people who have actually elected them. And so yes, there's been a lot of amazing statements that these last few days have been able to make. And for me, the summary of it is that parliament is stronger than we have been made to think in the past. And that when parliament wants to do, it is able to do. And that parliamentarians going forward should not be like me who works in a civil society organization. And so the only ways to be able to express my views is through press statements and appearing on media platforms and issuing you know, reports and what have you for them. They have the voice, they have the say, they are not strangers like I am in parliament. They have various platforms and means that can make them get their minds to it. Things can be done. Uh, just a quick bit on the National Cathedral. I also spoke about the allocation for that. How far do you think is too far? You know, well, but you can only measure it from what the benchmark was from the beginning. So what is the baseline? You know, I mean, I work in civil society. We would like to usually establish baseline for purposes of monitoring and evaluation. What's the baseline? At the beginning, what were we told? At the beginning, we were told that, yes, we needed to build a national cathedral. But of course, government was going to provide the land and government was going to provide, you know, all of those. Uh, uh, we were told about <laughs> seed money. And initially, we saw a figure of 25 million, which was heavily contested. But after the 25 million, there have been so many add-ons and so many alloc allocations year on year. It's, it's the more reason I'm saying what I'm saying. So the baseline was established on what the very wet scenario should be when it comes to seed. Then seed money moves away from being seed, you know, a, a situation that the anti-corruption people consider as a, a, a high corruption risk area if you want to use it to fund such major situations which are not contingency by any stretch of imagination. You know, and so for me, it, it starts with what the baseline was. What were we promised? What were the people of Ghana told at the very start of this as going to be the way that this cathedral will be funded? And what are we seeing now? Because leadership must be held accountable. Duty bearers must be able to, 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 to account for their own words, actions and inactions, their own commitment at the beginning of projects. And when they are reneging on that or they want to make a change, they must be humble enough to come to us and say that, look, we thought that we could be able to go through it, through this pathway. We realize that things are different. Could we please have you, you know, reason with us so we can make amendments? Not through the back door, not through trying to bamboozle their way through. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, quickly, Al Hassan. So, your your take on those two as well? Uh, what should have been allotted to the government machinery? Cut down, slashed by seventeen million, and the national cathedral. And and on the national cathedral, I would like to find out from you what can we expect to be the posturing of the minority moving forward, especially as you have caused to be jettisoned this eighty million allocation, which now will go into other things. And how will you follow up? on the 80 million to ensure that it goes into what we've been told it will go into? Well, first of all, um, the follow-up uh, will be done by uh, all of us, but yes, more especially by uh, members of parliament who are especially responsible for uh, the committee on roads and also uh, the communications committee because the appropriation uh, that was eventually passed uh, 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 you know, captured the 80 million as being uh, uh, redistributed between communications and routes. So I expect the committees responsible for uh, the two to uh, monitor it. Um, as for the cathedral and how the house arrived at the decision to uh, scrap the 80 million that was uh, allocated to it, I'll urge the general public to, uh, I think it's still online, follow the debate uh, that, you know, took place, you know, on the floor of parliament uh, in the wee hours of yesterday. I think the debate started at about 2 a.m. or thereabout. And how I wish that it was uh, during the daytime when people were awake to have listened to the wisdom of uh, Dr. Kobna Donko and that of uh, Samuel uh, George, uh, using, you know, 
the Bible and, uh, you know, quotations from the Bible uh, to educate us all and, 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 and many who followed online why this uh, particular uh, investment uh, and, if you like, not just an investment, this particular uh, scheme of government to right. steal people's money uh, was, 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 was just uh, sad. I will also urge others, uh, people to listen to uh, 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 Mr. Woyomi on this debate and uh, Honorable Kodo, who dealt with the numbers mm. and how government has turned this whole uh, venture into a scheme just to steal uh, money. At the end of the day, the finance minister who was on the floor and listening to the debate had no choice than to concede that it was a misplaced uh, allocation and it had to be withdrawn and redistributed. Uh, I think that moving forward uh, as a minority, we will continue to ask the relevant questions. And like Sami again says, the baseline, what were we promised? And uh, we need to keep reminding them of what we were promised. And to uh, remind them of what we were promised is not to say that the minority does not want the president to you know, build a, a cathedral, uh, you know, that he promised to deliver for God. But it's just to remind him to do so uh, within the promise that he shared with us. And also uh, within, within, within budget, if there is any, because as we speak now, there's no budget. And for me, you know, what people miss, the point that I think people miss, or they don't, but they are just afraid to talk about, right. is how President Akufuado you know, uh, won power in 2016. He threw in everything, did all the politics that is acceptable and unacceptable, and that is how he got elected in 2016. Look, many, for example, even on the floor, tried to make this a contest between Muslims and Christians. Um, as some of our leaders had to caution the deputy majority leader who went on that, that tangent as if to say, oh, and government is supporting Hyde, which is not even true, and all of that. You see, there is a national mox in this country that was built by an NGO, a Turkish NGO, yes, on government land. That, for me, was the basis of this promise of Nana Kufuadu to God to build a cathedral. That, for me, was what informed that wrong decision and the wrong pledge, which may have been used even in his campaign, subtly to become president. And so in executing it, you will expect him to do it well and do it right and not to burden all of us the way he is burdening us. Because, I mean, what justification does he have to spend the open amounts of money that he's spending? When he initially told us that it was just going to be about $25 million and government providing land. Now we all know the cost of the buildings that were pulled down, buildings that were just three, four, five years old, housing judges, and the passport office, the cost of relocating it, and other private people who had landed property and offices around there, and how much it is costing the state to resettle all these people. And that is why in all of this, I am also very happy that as a minority, we succeeded in reducing the contingency vote this year, which was pegged at 1.4 billion to about 500 million. In fact, in 2016, the contingency vote operated on a zero allocation. That is what we must be seeking to do because the finance minister, when he appeared before the ad hoc committee on his censure motion, revealed to us that a lot of thievery, a lot of misapplication can take place when you allow a lot of funds to sit in the contingency vote. And so it is remarkable that we were able to reduce the votes for 2023 from 1.4 billion to only about 500 million. We must be looking you know, forward to ensuring that it is further reduced in subsequent years so that governments will not have the opportunity to bury such thievery as we are seeing in the uh, name of the construction of a cathedral uh, under the uh, 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 contingency vote. Thank you, Sir. Uh, I'm happy to hear you. Um, and, and the point is, why you, you talked about 
about the, the unnecessary comparison between Muslims and Christians in the country. It's, it's worth noting. Um, but it's, it's Christmas, and I'll give you the opportunity to send a message to your, <laughs> your, your Christian friends and family. But let me come to you, Dr. Amachi. So that's a, 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 one of the most topical, controversial issues we've discussed this year is about the National Cathedral. And the, the Parliament has been able to shoot down a proposal for some 80 million cities to be allocated to it. Also because people feel that this has been, been one, transparent e enough for us to even lend it our support. It, initially it started as something, then it metamorphoses into another. And we're not too sure even what we're doing and what the real progress is. How well do you think Parliament has handled the subject matter of the National Cathedral? Uh, I think um, they should go back to the executive and then they will want to restart it and build consensus around it and come out clearly with what the National Cathedral stands for, how it's going to be financed and all other religious issues. But I think critically, when you start to build consensus, and then you bring it to Parliament. You, 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 you give everybody there the opportunity to explore the positive elements of it. And then at the end of the day, it's likely you know, to see the light of day. Uh, the previous approach was, to the best of my understanding, unnecessarily top-down fashion. And I like to believe that is one of the reasons why it didn't, it didn't go through. I don't think even with, with, with the majority, you know, on the quiet, some of them, you know, uh, were, 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 were feeling fine about it, given the current economic challenges that we find ourselves in, you know, if we prioritize uh, issues in, 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 in the context of uh, austere tax, definitely National Cathedral will wait. So I think going forward, we need to build consensus around it and then move it. Right, Dr. Amachi, so we're quickly wrapping up, uh, but uh, we have uh, Andrea Japa Mercer with us. He is on the majority side in Parliament and Member of Parliament for Sekindi. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Mercer. Hello? Oh, sorry, we just lost him there. He just had the line drop too bad. Hopefully we can get him again. But as, as we wrap up this conversation, I mean, we're going for Christmas, but it's not as exciting for many people, not only because they don't have money, but there's a lot of things hanging. You know, usually at the end of the year, Benjamin, you'd want, you would want to wrap up beautifully and know what to look forward to. But here right. we are, the debt exchange program, we know uh, government has now decided these to... pension funds are out Exempt pension funds. But then means but, but they, but they have a bigger still challenge. talk exactly. with them about what alternatives there are. Yeah, so the bigger challenge is, will we be able to achieve what we want to achieve? Will we be able to reach that level of debt sustainability that will which is grant crucial. us? Which is very crucial. Without which we and, can't have an IMF program. And that's why I'm saying that we are wrapping up the year, but not really wrapping up the major issues. You know, you would have wanted that going into next year, we have a clear head, we know where we are going. So gentlemen, I'll take your quick thoughts on that as we look forward to 2023 and all that's left hanging on our shoulders. But I know that uh, we've been able to reach Angel, um, sorry. I said angel. Andrew, yeah. Asia, Mercer. <laughs> Christmas is about angels, isn't it? Mr. Mercer, thank you so much for joining us again. And, good morning, um, Good morning to have you here. So we've been discussing Parliament and the performance uh, of your colleagues and yourself. Uh, we've had a few ratings here and there. I'd like to start off with you and then you could uh, give us your general overview of what Parliament has been like for you. And then if there are any things you'd want to react to, we'll gladly take them quickly. So how would you rate the performance of Parliament on a score of 1 to 10? Well, Bennett, let me say good morning to uh, your good self once again and to my friend Benjamin and to your cherished uh, viewers. Indeed, I, I, I called in to your producer to uh, specifically respond to some statements that my good friend Alassane Suyini made on your show. Uh, but before I respond, to that, as you've asked me, uh, I, I think that Parliament largely has done well. Uh, there's been some unfortunate incidents that I felt we could have handled much more better. 
uh, there's been decisions that we've taken that uh, if you listen carefully to Alassane Tuhini, he himself uh, admits uh, in large measure that uh, uh, led to significantly the economic crisis that we face facing uh, this time around, uh, especially when he makes reference to the comments that His Excellency the President made at our Congress last year, which then, according to him, led to the kind of responses that the minority put up that delayed the passage of the e-levy. Uh, it was essentially grandstanding, uh, playing politics with the destiny of our country. Uh, of course, when you say it, they tend to deny it. But uh, listening to him, uh, it's a clear admission that those actions that took place during the passage of the e-levy, which then <coughs> our friends on the other side declined in breach of Section 22 of the Public Financial Management Act, which enjoins Parliament to pass the appropriation, pass the budget, pass the appropriation, and pass every other revenue measure that goes to feed the budget by 31st December had consequences on our economy in 2022. Okay, but uh, that's in the past. Uh, the consequences we are all facing. Government has resorted to the IMF and staff level agreements reached. I'm hopeful that all the things that need to be done to ensure that we obtain board approval in the coming months would be uh, uh, done so that uh, we can work together to bring our economy back on stream. Uh, of course, I have significant uh, views on uh, what took place last uh, two nights, okay? But mm. I guess that time may not permit us to uh, deal with all of, all of that. Right. But, but you see, look, it's good to play politics and advance our positions, uh, uh, you know, forcefully and strongly. But to peddle, permit me, or pardon me, bare face life, uh, it's not the way to go. What, what are the lies? If you can be specific and it, then address them quickly. It is not quickly. true that in 2016, government operated on a zero contingency vote. It's false. It's a palpable false. Indeed, it's unfortunate I came to the constituency last evening. Otherwise, I would have shown you documents if I was in Accra. During the central motion, documents that we obtained on the uses that Mr. Muhammad's presidency deployed on continuous, from the contingency vote between 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. And so to come on air and speak to the Ghanaian people, as if to say what Mr. Foriata did was untoward, and that your government in 2016 operated on a zero contingency vote, when you know very well that that assertion is false. Unfortunate. Completely unfortunate. I disagree with the whole lot of things that he said, but of course, I was not a guest on your show. Uh, Eugene, my good friend, I have been monitoring from the beginning, was the one that you tried to reach it. The line has not permitted. But I think that we need to put the record straight and clear for the good people of Ghana to know what the truth is. And the truth is that in 2016, the NDC administration did not, as alleged by my good friends, we need to operate on a zero continuity vote. Right. Okay. Uh, but I, I asked you to, well, you gave us a general overview, but you didn't give us a score, but that's fine. Um, but your, your, your quick thoughts now. You, you are with the governing party. You're going into the new year unsure about a lot of things. How does that make you feel? And uh, what is the way forward? We know that the finance minister has said we have to look at other options of um, ensuring that we reach uh, a sustainable debt level. As it stands now, we are not too sure what that is. If you know any information you can share with us, we'll be glad to have it. But well, basically, I, I don't know about going into the year unsure about many things. Uh, we've gotten a budget approved. We've gotten uh, an appropriation approved. Of course, those are all projections that year on year, uh, parliaments approve for governments to implement. Uh, my understanding is uh, that the finance ministry is committed to pursue the policies that have been outlined in the budget to ensure that we bring our economy back to uh, a good path. We're going to pursue the debt sustainability program that we have uh, uh, rolled out 
Well, of course, yesterday uh, I saw in the media, indeed, I listened to the press briefing where the finance minister had made some confessions. Uh, when I came on your show two days ago, uh, Benjamin put it to me and I said, ah, look, the government was going to engage with the labor front to see some middle ground that can be achieved. So we all have a win-win situation. Uh, of course, a caveat that was issued in the press release was to the effect that both parties were going to work together Okay, after government had agreed to exempt the pension uh, 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 or pensions of the uh, 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 labor unions that they were advocating again, they were going to work together to ensure. Uh, and so, as the conversation rolls out, I expect that people would see what the reality is and, and make further concessions if the need arises, so that we can all work together uh, uh, consciously to bring back our economy. Uh, so you're saying that there's nothing we're not we're not unsure about anything i just so gave not, you not an example all. of that i mean we're going to implement the budget uh, unlike last year where you had your revenue budget some of it not approved that then led to ratings agencies downgrading your economy subsequently being hit by uh, the russian ukraine war that compounds your issue uh, the performance after it was passed three months thereafter Right. Uh, not looking up. Uh, uh, of course, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But all things being equal, uh, we expect that our commitment to the implementation of the 2023 budget would begin the path of restoring our economy back to a growth path within the time frame that has been indicated by the Right. Administration. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Andrew Japan, my, my SIS, MP for Second D and uh, also with the governing New Patriotic Party. So your, your final words, gentlemen, looking forward to 2023, knowing all that hangs in the balance for us as a country, what are your expectations for the coming year? Let me start with you, uh, Dr. Amache. Hello, Doc. Kindly unmute your device. Um, I'm saying that we're going to continue with the merry go round. Actually, only that things are going to be, you know, a, a bit more. Uh, I was going to say terrible, but I wanted to simply reduce the uh, impact a little. But things aren't going to be very good economically for the good people of Ghana. Anytime you have to work with the IMF, it means you're going to go through austere times economically. So that is what I think it means. Uh, should prepare themselves for. Mm. And, and now that we are not through with this debt restructuring thing, right? Then, uh, you know, we, we simply are not sure, just like you said, you know, I mean, what the uh, future has for us. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Samuel Bing, let me come to you. What, what are you looking forward to in 2023? And uh, what, what should we also be bracing ourselves for? Well, uh, for me, my 2023 expectations will be more to the Parliament, obviously, I'm biased um, as, as someone who works for an organization um, I, I think that Parliament will be very critical in our 2023 and beyond, you know, especially as we, we work ourselves as a country out of the current situation we find ourselves in with IMF possibly coming in and all of that. We have seen literature you know, across the globe on how parliaments play a role in these processes when a country finds itself there. And so uh, parliamentary accountability, you know, for me would be the order of the day for 2023. How do we hold that co-equal branch of government, the legislature to account as much as we hold the executive branch to account? It's by our executive branch to account. But as a co equal branch of government, the legislature must also be held, you know, to account. So, uh, you know, the people have huge expectations. Whatever happened two days ago and whatever kind of budget has been passed and the things that were disallowed, you know, when you posted on social media and you engage on social media platforms, many people are saying, this is great. However, would our parliament be able to see these things through? Would they monitor it effectively? Would they ensure that the executive branch does not do what they have been told not to do. And so those things will be, will be monitored. We'll, we'll be monitoring how Parliament, you know, goes back to issues that it's supposed to deal with. The, uh, the Honourable Member for Dom Kwabinye's situation together with the others who were cited 
for uh, uh, who, are, who are taking to the privileges committee for absence, we still would put fire to the to the to the feet on Parliament to let us know what kind of conclusion they brought to on the debacle of January 7th. There is still the issue of committees of Parliament and the kinds of work that are before them and whether they are living up to expectations. I think that that needs to be checked, even including the right honourable speaker as the third most powerful you know uh, person of the land handling another co-equal branch of government not from the ruling party i think that he must also not escape accountability together with the parliamentary service so all of these things will have to come you know uh, uh, to the fore and uh, for me 2023 will be one of those years that parliament must show that indeed it is important in the entire you know governance architecture of our country and that wherever we find ourselves now if we will get out of it we can only get out of it with the collaboration and the help and the support of the parliament of Ghana. Right. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, Samuel Bing. God willing, next year we are back again, Monetary Parliament. Let me end with you, Alhassan Suhini. And uh, on, the, on the note of what the next year holds for us and what you'd like to share with your Christian family and friends. Dennis, I just took a second look of your dress and you look amazing. I think that uh, you must pay extra for uh, that outfit. It's, thank, it's thank you. Thank you, Alhassan. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas uh, to you too. I admire the confidence with which uh, my brothers in the MPP, especially Andrew Mesha, uh, can deny or denounce uh, things that are said that they find unpleasant, especially about their government, without uh, providing any contrary uh, evidence. Uh, they just they just deny deny and denounce it strongly, and then uh, it is it is it is it is in their mind. Uh, supposed to be treated as a fact because they say so. In fact, I was expecting you to ask him to give us the contingency vote for 2016 since he says that uh, it but, wasn't zero. Then what was it? I have given a figure. He just says it wasn't zero. Well, and he did he mention that he, he he didn't have the documents on hand, but we, we, well, we, we so, will try so, and so, get so it. So without the, without, I said it's zero. I mean, if he doesn't have a figure, the fact that he says it's not zero doesn't make it uh, the truth. And, Fair point. But I admire the force Fair with which he's I admire the, the force with which he, uh, he says it. And then he talks about, uh, uh, you know, he ignores the fact that the president was irresponsible in his comments after the appropriation was passed in 2022. He ignores the fact that the comment was irresponsible. And then he accuses the minority of grandstanding, as if to say grandstanding necessarily uh, is, is irresponsible. Grandstanding is part of politics. But the fact, however, is that the minority was not even grandstanding. We were actually opposed to a tax handle that we thought was going to distort our tax policies in this country and clearly one that was not supported by majority of Ghanaians. and time has you know vindicated us uh, the, 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 the output of that tax handle and how much government is getting from it has actually vindicated the positions that we took and so they must just uh, for once hold themselves responsible for some of the mess that they have put us in instead of always seeking for you know, the next person uh, to, to blame. But having said that, yes, uh, we have been told that pension funds will not be touched as far as the, uh, you know, uh, DSA is concerned, the discussions around it is concerned. Uh, that is for the future, but we have to survive today before we can even think about, you know, our pensions. And it is quite disheartening that uh, we are even in this conversation to, to look for you know, where the shortfall will come from. Because if pension funds are not going to be tied, it means there's going to be a certain, you know, fallout that has to be taken care of, you know, by 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 all of us. So it tells us that our our burden is not even uh, over. <laughs> you know, what we know, the haircuts that we are already going through is not all that we are going to take into 2023. Because the conversation to find out where the shortfall will come from uh, is an indication that uh, we may even be getting Sakura and not just uh, Punky Joe and all of that. But we pray that the good Lord who has preserved us and kept us throughout 2022 will continue to abide with us and uh, bless us as we move into 2023. And let me take this opportunity to wish uh, all, uh, you know, constituents of Tamale North and beyond a Merry Christmas and a Happy, Happy New Year, especially the Christian fraternity in the Tamale North constituency and beyond. Merry Christmas to everyone, and I wish you all a prosperous New Year.
Right, thank you so much, Al Hassan Sihini. There, uh, wishing all of us a Merry Christmas. Well, from Benjamin and I, you know, we've been doing so since the beginning of the week, uh, talking about Christmas and all. And we'll be back to talk more about Christmas um, because the Fright Hall Joy FM family party in the pack is the perfect place for your family. It's happening on the 26th of December at the Ibri Botanical Gardens at 9 a.m. till you decide you've had enough fun. It's 100 cities for a family of six. Come on. You can purchase your ticket from the Joy FM front desk or dial the short code star 713 star 003 hash select one and select joy party in the pack or call 026-512-5318 for inquiries the joy fm family party in the pack is sponsored by fry tall sunflower cooking oil enjoy the goodness of tasty meals fortune rise always on point just like mom alliance life insurance we secure your future syntax tank a eh, strong a eh, tough and supported by atl bringing fabrics to life Mobile Doctors GH, the doctor at your home, Ghana AIDS Commission, condomlet sex is risky. If it's not on, it's definitely not in. Kuamek, start the medicine that works. Joy FM Family Party in the Park, your number one family outdoor event. For ticket reservation, please call 0540106466. Tickets are running out really fast, and so you want to just purchase one and secure a spot for yourself and your family. We'll be back with more this day. Thank you so much for staying here on the AM show. Let's talk about Santa's Wonderland. It's an annual event uh, organized by the Fitzgerald, which aims to take the whole family on an enchanted Christmas adventure with loads of exciting activities. Nathaniel Wula Kuteta is facility manager at the Fitzgerald. Good morning to you, Nathaniel, and Merry Christmas in advance. Tell us more about this year's Santa's Wonderland. Good morning, good morning to our cherished viewers and Merry Christmas to everyone. Right, so like you rightly said, um, at the first year out, we want to make every moment, not just a Christmas, a memorable one, as we are noted for as an event center. And so for the past three years, every December, we have what we call Santa's Wonderland, which we bring Christmas to the families of Ghanaians. And so uh, this year as well, we have a five-day park event to thrill families uh, and teach them to a good Christmas. Uh, so that is basically what Santa's Wonderland is so, about. So how long is this running? How can people take advantage of it? Do they need to pay for tickets? Do they just walk in? What exactly are the, the things that they have to uh, get to secure this experience? Right. So, uh, uh, this experience is a five day long experience. It starts from today at 4, and then it ends on Tuesday. That's the 27th of uh, December 2022. And so uh, when you want a ticket, there's a premises at this cantonment. Or you can just go to our Instagram handle, and that is Santa at Santa's underscore Wonderland. And then you can uh, get the details. But uh, before then, I would like to break down a bit what the activities look like. For Please go activities. ahead. Please go ahead. Let me. Okay. So, thank you. So for day one, which is today, we are looking at what we call Festival of Light and Santa's Spirit. You know, so today basically begins the whole day. So we are setting the tone. And we are lighting up the entire venue, the first year out, uh, and creating the Christmas moment. As well, we would have the Santa Spirit where we will go to uh, the Santa's Goto, and then as well, we we'll go to Mrs. Cross. We have the train ride, we'll have treasure hunt, among other things. For uh, the event, I would say that. It is something that uh, you would love to be there to experience because words can not explain everything of Christmas. And so we have over 
was the night before Christmas to set this world. There will be a lot of display of art and performances to thrill our cherished uh, patrons to uh, this season's Santa's Wonderland. And then, like we all know, day three is a Christmas day. And so there's also going to be a whole lot of events for the children, especially. And then day four is a big one, what we call brunch with Santa and movie night. And so uh, each and every day has something for the family. Each day is a family packed event. And then the final day we have costume party and Christmas carnival. So Why? these pack these packages come in uh, two separate packages. We have what we call the, uh, uh, the golden package and then the standard package. So speaking to it, they want to and they for a golden event. Golden events means that we have the standard event for the kids, and then we have special event for the parents as well, or the adults. And that includes the movie nights, the brunch, among others. So, right. um, yeah, basically these are the, the, the packages. All if right, you want, so... If you allow me, mm. I can also go through the rate. Right, a qu a quickly, sir. So, while okay, you so go... For, uh, when you're done, you can just give us if there are any persons or sites to visit uh, or persons to contact. You can just drop the numbers there so we can reach out to the Fitzgerald. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so let me just go through the, the prizes and then I can keep the hand so and then the, the number. Okay, so for golden tickets, for kids, the prize is 250 CDs. And then for adults, is 275 CDs. <clears throat> That's for the golden events. For standard events, it's 185 CDs for kids and 75 CDs for the adults. And if you want to reach us at the first round, the phone number to reach is 0557. 067173 0557 067173 and our Instagram handle is at Santes underscore Wonderland underscore GH at Santes underscore Wonderland underscore GH So quickly Nathaniel and on Facebook mm -hmm. is at the Fitzgerald Yeah at, It's at the Fitzgerald I'm Right listening. Right So um, quickly, the golden ticket, yes, you said the golden ticket event days. were three days. So if I purchase a ticket, does it cater for all the three days or I have to pay for each day's ticket? Okay, thank you very much for that question. So each day has its own ticket because the events are different. So right. each day for a kid is 250 Cities for a golden event and 275 for an adult. Right. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and a Merry Christmas to you. That's Nathaniel Ula Kuteta, facility manager of the Fitzgerald, where Santa's Wonderland will be experienced from today all through to Tuesday. So you can just find them on social media and then pick up a ticket for your family and yourself and enjoy the season. We'll take a quick breather. When we come back, we'll take your thoughts as we get interactive. Do stay. Welcome back. Benjamin joins me and it's time to get interactive with you. Just call us, let us know what your thoughts are on the major issues we've been discussing this week. We've been talking a lot about the debt exchange program and the position of organized labor. We know that as it stands now, pension funds have not been touched, at least for the first time, Benjamin, or the first time in a long time. We've seen government labor really... Yes. 
because it, I remember when we spoke to uh, Dr. Yalba, the Secretary General of the yeah. TUC, on his way to that meeting at the Finance Ministry, he said their position was constant. They hadn't changed their minds, and it looked like it paid off for them. But the bigger question then is, what next? What does the future hold for us? We need to find out from the, the Finance Minister. I'm told we have a first caller on the line. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, good morning. This is Abendao. Abendao, hi. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well. And you? We're doing fantastic. Thanks for calling. Let's hear what you have to say. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, but, um, um, Akwako, Ben is, um, Nebri Atari, Obekwa Hokawati. What did he say? What's this? Mantio, Abendao. Mese. Eh, eh. Mese Ben is Nebri Atari, and I was trying to see the whole thing. Oh, no problem. <laughs> no problem, Kran. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, on a serious note, um, I want to assign you small. You, you know that um, on the reduction of the, uh, listen, uh, the transport fares, mm -hmm. most of the drivers, they have uh, refused to reduce it to the actual um, amount. And what happens is that, um, for instance, if the fare was uh, 44 cities and it has been reduced by 15.3%, it is about uh, six cities, uh, seventy percent. So what they do is that instead of them to reduce the six cities so that uh, it will go around um, thirty-eight percent, uh, so thirty-eight cities, they rather make it forty cities. Mean that uh, they really reduce it up to um, the actual amount. So what I suggest is that uh, if you can get the regional uh, DPR to you leaders uh, contacts available, so that we can uh, call them and then lodge this problem. To compare the drivers to reduce to the actual uh, first. Right, I mean, now thanks for your comment, but just on that one, we spoke to the spokesperson for the GPRTU yeah, about, about two more. days ago, and his suggestion is that you go, you report to the station. At every station, they have GPRTU executives there. Right. And so I don't know about the regional executives and their numbers being all over. You can imagine the number of commuters and how burdensome that may be. Right. So um, the suggestion is that you go to the station and make that report. And we also are being told that some of them are making adjustments here and there. So uh, we should. But, but it's, a, it's a valid point he makes about usually the drivers, and, and there is that situation there right. where when there's a rollover, for example, 20%, if 20% is going to be maybe 10 CDs, 60 pesos, 10 mm -hmm. CDs, 70 pesos, you would see them rolling over to like 11 CDs, making way more. I mean, these are complaints that we have every now and then. And when there's a reduction, then, you know, the shortchanging comes in. And of course, that is also problematic. And it's an area we ought to look at. Definitely. Thank you so much for calling Nazar Ben Dao. You can also share your thoughts with us. 0302 the numbers to call. Benjamin. <laughs> well, I guess uh, we're gradually winding down on the show, but we're expecting your calls right before we serve you Joy News Desk. If you also want to call and sing a Christmas carol for us, why not? We would indulge you once you know the carol. Aha, uh -huh. once you know the carol. It would be interesting to have some of you call through and uh, sing for us Christmas is Christmas in mm. the air? It, it is in the air. We a have colleague a was telling me that they can't, we can't smell Christmas like that, but it is in the air. It's yeah. also interesting. Around this time, Hamatan should have, you know, started. It has certain. In. Well, I can In feel certain it. places, but not. It's not biting. Okay, yet. we have a caller from Wa. Let's ask him. Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Do you feel the Hamatan in Wa? Yeah. Good morning, madam. How are you? Doing? I am blessed. Thanks for asking. Hope you're well too. Yeah. Oh, what do we find? Do you yeah, feel the hamatan? This, come again. Do you feel the hamatan? Oh yeah, the hamatan we are feeling it. Okay, then it's coming so down south. Wish then. We will also be there with you so that <laughs> this hamatan will not. Be there Don't worry, we'll catch up with us. Shared pain, eh? What? What are thoughts? <laughs> Let's hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we are talking about the transfer, uh, the transport service uh, phase. Right. Uh, in fact, there have been a reduction, but if you look at it. Uh, those traders have not even reduced their commodity. And in fact, with that, it's affecting a lot of people. Okay. And when you even talk about it, you see they have been a, like a little reduction in their fuel prices. Okay. So based on that, they are not also willing to reduce. Even, even some have even reduced theirs, but others have refused 
to reduce their product. So I don't know how much they want the government to reduce their fuel prices so that they can also reduce their commodities prices. So, and I think this one is very worrisome. If you, the media, can also intervene so that things will improve for the better for all of us. Thank you. Right. So I think um, about two or three days ago, um, we, we discussed this, Benjamin. There were some concerns, but there were also reactions to those concerns from some yeah. market women. Yeah. And uh, some of them made the point that, look, we purchased our products, which we are retailing mm. at a certain price when the dollar was high. You don't expect us to be able to, you know, just cut, slash the prices because we bought it at a certain cost and we must pass on uh, the cost to the consumer. And so I think realistically from next year, uh, maybe the first quarter of next year, some of them will be done with their stock yeah. and then we'll be able to see price changes. But to expect it in the immediate term would That's also be a bit insensitive. I mean, who does business to lose? All right. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Alhaji from Tamale could be our last caller today. Hello, Alhaji. Let's hear you, please. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Alhaji. Yeah, good morning, madam. How good, are you? Good morning. Please, what's your name? I'm Alaji Abdullah Red, Director of Communications, Tamale South. Director of Communications for? NPP, Tamale right. South. Tamale. Tamale. All right, okay. Let's hear you, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are feeling that we're turning in Tamale. Mm. The condition is not good for us in Tamale today. Sorry. So, what I want to say is that, my brother, I think that I have to thank you very much and my good brother sitting down there for the good work for this country. I'm mean, monitoring your program day in, day out. But what I'm getting signal from the drivers and this is in this country, they are not being fair to the masses of this country. If the fuel increase or if there's an increment of fuel, you have to increase your price. But if there's a reduction of fuel, you have to increase your price again. So I don't think what they are doing is good for this country. So that you think that this country first before they are looking for their money. Look, if the country is broke, it's going to affect each and every person in this country. So I'm just appealing to everybody, uh, throttle drivers, taxi drivers, that they should come down small. If the fuel increase, we all know that things are increased. I think that nobody will have a problem with them. But if they are saying that fuel is one one or uh, this and, and they are trying to do this, I think that they are not being fair to Ghanaians, they are not being fair to themselves, and they are not being fair to all over the country. So I'm just begging them they should come down the price and everything is successful for that. Thank you but so much. But my challenge this morning right. is that I get a lot of complaints this morning about Namco beneficiaries. I think that they have paid. Plenty of them in Tamil do not get their service. And they are ready to uh, celebrate the Christmas. So I'm just appealing to Joy FM if you can speak out to the National uh, Office NAPCO so that they work on it for us. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you so much for calling us. And that was our last caller. And uh, thank you all for making time to be part of today's program. We really appreciate it that you wake up every morning to join us. Do this, Benjamin. But before we go, and uh, it's interesting, the name was not mentioned, but Ador Kluche, uh, you sent a message concerning your daughter who is two years today. Ain't oh. that cute? Two years. Very adorable. Uh, you didn't add the name, but Ador Kluche's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> happy a very happy to second birthday, birthday to you. Your, your birthday is close to uh, Jesus' birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy right. birthday to so you. So how Bye about best. taking, uh, I mean, uh, adult Lucha, how about taking your daughter to the family party in the park? Fun idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun On idea. Monday. Together Monday with your hubby party. and everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you just, just call us here at Joy FM, pick up a ticket for six. If your family's not up to six, you can call some friends along. You can add us. Yeah, you can pay for us. Add us. We'll be <laughs> members of your family. <laughs> and then we go have some fun. Kitty will be there. Kwame Eugene. Kabna, Kabna. I'm told the Perez music will be there. And for the father, we are creating something special for you this time around. Just a little father's corner for you to have some fun. So, Benjamin, that will be it. We wish you a very merry, merry Christmas in advance. We hope that you enjoy the season, reflect on the goodness of God, the love of God towards, towards mankind. And if you can, 
just show some love to another person. I'll be showing some love to Benjamin next week. <laughs> you won't understand, but next when next week comes, you understand what it means by showing him some love. Benjamin. And I'll show love to her when the new year starts. But it is what it is. It's been fantastic. Uh, quite a year, though, quite 2022 year. Quite has year. been. Quite a year. Well, we'll see. We'll see what the next year A roller coaster us. of a year, but a right. wonderful year God has blessed us with. So from Benjamin and I, it's a very Merry Christmas Please, to you. Please, let's do this. From Bernus Abubedu Lanza and <laughs> Benjamin Akakbo. Merry Christmas to you. Stay safe. Please don't drink and drive. We need you alive for the next year. Up next is News Desk with Samuel Kujabrace. Goodbye. <laughs>